get the lead at the beginning of this race. He, he knows that his car is quicker out of the tight corners and he doesn't want to get bogged down behind the BMW. So I think Dick has accepted the fact they might break axles, but it's very important to get the lead and that's what he'll be trying to do at the start of the race. And I'd expect to see uh, Dick get a handy lead in the first lap and then be followed by three BMWs and Peter Brock is liable to come through in the first lap and be anywhere except probably in the first position after lap one. I think in terms of the start, the man to watch might be Tom Walkinshaw in the Rover coming up through the field because I would expect him to get a quicker start than the BMWs in front of him. There are three BMWs right in front of him and Peter Brock alongside him. Both well, of those will be trying to get through that field early on. Yes, it's a narrow circuit initially, but with those tight hairpins and braking being very difficult, Walkinshaw has the ability to crash through this field in the first lap, but he wants to finish the race and not get involved in accidents, so I think he'd just be a bit cautious. What a superb grid we have. What a superb group of wonderful cars in Group A. A Falcon on the front, then three BMWs, then a VK Commodore, then the Rover Vitesse, and then we have a mixture of the smaller cars, the Fiat 130R Bart, the Corolla GTs, uh, the Alfa Romeo GTV, another Corolla GT, another Corolla GT, a Golf GTI. There's a wonderful mixture of cars We've here. We've also got the Audi back there, and we mustn't forget the Volvo at the back of the grid. We've got to remember that Michelle Dalcour is a very determined driver, and we should watch this man in the first lap. If anybody's going to cause any fireworks, it's that red car at the back of the grid. The one-minute board has gone up, not far away from a start now, in the Nissan Sport 500, on the race, on the streets of Wellington. Wow. Engines getting warm now, waiting for the flag to drop. In fact, it's a light start. They're away. The green light is going. They're away for a start. Nick Johnson out of the lead. Coming through on the inside, Peter Brock in the third place. Never flies in second. Great right little battle. A very good start from Peter Brock getting up to third place there. Behind Neville Crichton. Dick Johnson leads. Neville Crichton second. Peter Brock third. Bruce horsepower of the big Falcon is just powering Dick Johnson away. This is what he wants to do. Make that initial break. And the grunt is getting him out of the corners so fast. Tom Walkershaw, very aggressive, taking different lines. He's not going to sit back and wait to get through. In the first few laps, he's going to be aggressive. Gary Pedersen also getting an excellent start on the field, up to sixth place. Dick Johnson's got at least 100 metres on the field already. Now, powers into the tight turns there, hard, left, hard right into the first gear. Neville Crichton following him hard in second place. Peter Brock already in third and flying. Good start from Frank Sittner as well. Frank Sittner, a very experienced European He's driven on long circuits, and um, he said that he, he can be aggressive when he wants to be, and he's sure showing his talents now. Well, Neville Crichton not letting Dick Johnson get too far away early on. Peter Brock still in third place, then Frank Sittner, then Ken Bajan. Oh, Frank Sittner, I think, may be a bit of a surprise here. He's really trying very hard, and he's not going to sit behind Peter Brock unless he has to. Here's your leader on lap one, Dick Johnson, the mighty Ford Falcon leading the Nissan Sport 500. Dick Johnson through first, Neville Crichton through second, Peter Brock through third, then Frank Sinton, then Bates, Tom Walkinshaw. Tom Walkinshaw back there, um, I would have expected him to be further up after lap one, but uh, well, that's the way it is, the New Zealanders and the other overseas contingents have got ahead of him. And already the Volvo up to about eighth place, they've come through half the field in the first lap, so watch for them coming through. Dick Johnson still pulling away this lead. I know this is his tactic. The flag you saw wave there is got oil on the track. I was talking to Michel Delcour before, and he said they wanted to get up as fast, as fast as possible, but he doesn't want to have an accident on the way. And he was very determined to get to the front, but not to have an accident. But Michel Delcour has come right through this field, and you can see him in the picture there now. He's got right ahead of all the little cars and he's trying very hard. It's Paul Adams in front of him and his Toyota Sprinter, Michel De Cruz, about to take him. A wonderful drive already and he hasn't bent the car, so he'll be very pleased. Wayne Wilkinson will be really wrapped to be up in second place ahead of his arch-rival TV-style Neville uh, Kent Bajan's car, driven in this part by Neil Lowe. There we follow Neville go Wayne Wilkinson onto the bridge, oh, sorry, through the gates. And then the tote, that's a wide line for Neil Lowe, very wide line. He'll lose that place to, to Tom Walker. Jordan. No, no, he's fought back. It seems to me, David, that Peter Brock is holding things up just a little. Well, of course, we know that he's not that familiar with the, the speed.
speed he's required to keep in traffic. He hasn't done a lot of fast laps with cars. And uh, he's just dialing himself in, as he calls it. Handily placed, but uh, Neil Lowe will be kicking himself. He lost a little momentum there and dropped back from the main group. So there's the leader, Dick Johnson, pulling away that lead. That's his tactics, Wayne Wilkinson in second place in the Wilkinson Bright BMW. Peter Brock, still third. Frank Sittner behind him. The Sittner and the hit Beijing Neil Lowe car are running on Pirelli tyres, which we understand are a little bit harder than the Dunlop seen on Neville Cried to Wayne Wilkinson's car. Now this may be causing the tail end sliding that we're seeing on the Neil Lowe entry. Neil Lowe's getting an awful lot of oversteer. We'll watch this in the next few laps. He said that it takes about four laps to bring those tyres into temperature. Talking to Frank Sittner last night, and he says he can win this race because his tyres will give the same performance throughout the race. He's using a harder compound, and they won't overheat, so he gets expects to get consistent lap times for the whole race. And he's holding a wonderful position at the moment, doing very, very well on a hard compound. So his consistency of performance will keep him there right away. And he's definitely being held up by Peter Brock at the moment, which is surprising. I expected Brock to be able to, to uh, get away from Frank Sittner, but he's not. This is an excellent race from Wayne Wilkinson in second place. This is Peter Brock and Frank Sittner behind him. Frank Sittner getting very frustrated. Wayne Wilkinson in second place with Dick Johnson pulling away the lead. Wilkinson not really being challenged by Brock and Brock still appearing to hold up Frank Sittner a little. Neil Lowe still getting wide. Behind Neil Lowe is Tom Walkinshaw. Well, mustn't forget uh, the fact that I think the Volvo is catching a lot of them. I just saw a glimpse of it in the picture before. I'm fairly sure the Volvo is closing in on everybody. We make that Volvo now in seventh place on the track. There's Tom Walkinshaw in sixth. Very shortly we should see the... There it is, the Volvo is definitely closing in. Well, when that catch, the power of that car catches up to the others, we're going to see some passing that we haven't seen before. Superb driving from Michel Delcourt, the Belgian professional driver. He had to do his practice laps in the first three sessions in an ordinary standard Nissan Y track Bluebird. But our race leader is still Dick Johnson, the man from Queensland, who has had so much bad luck in recent years. I know this was the way he wanted to do it, to get out in the first ten laps and try and build the sort of lead that will allow him to cruise just a little and stay on times that the Falcon will last for. 150 laps of the race. And Dick Johnson really working very, very hard to pull that lead away. He knew from practice times yesterday that he was quicker than the rest of the field. The question mark has been over the reliability of the Falcon, as with the other cars in an endurance race. Wayne Wilkinson driving superbly in second place. Getting a bit of breather, though, from Peter Brock holding up uh, Frank Sittner. Frank Sittner is very frustrated to see him trying exceptionally hard to pass Peter Brock. And I feel if Frank Sittner can get past Peter Brock, he will start making inroads on Wayne Wilkinson. And Neil Lowe also catching up to uh, closing on the Peter Brock. Frank Sittner is a back hit two curves very hard. Over the bridge, he hit a curve, a curve with the right front wheel and coming into the pit straight, another curve. Now, if he keeps that up, he'll be damaging a rim and he certainly will be into the pits. So watch for that right front and left front wheel as Sittner is desperately trying to get find a hole past Peter Brock. Uh, Peter Brock is proving a very, very hard man to pass. Yes, he's got a V8 engine and gets out of the corner as well and they can't pass him on the straight, so the only way he can really... Frank Sittner can pass it under braking. But we mustn't forget the fact that the Volvo is closing on all of them. I mean, there's a the Volvo in the back of your picture now in seventh place, and this is getting a scrap. Tom Walkinshaw getting frustrated and not being able to get through too. So look for fireworks. We're going to see someone trying to outbreak very shortly, and a car could go off at any time. Well, it's an amazingly aggressive start for a four hour race. It is, and I just can't get over this man, Michel Del Kerr. He's just closing in every lap. Sitting and trying hard, but not able to get past the V8 power of the Commodore. Well, of, of course, we've seen this all before. When you get three or four cars this closely bunched, they slow down their own pace. They're actually like Indian filing, but they're blocking their own paths of escape. They're making sure that people don't climb through gaps. So their actual pace has dropped. Now the Volvo is really closing up. Very shortly, we're going to see some passing manoeuvres and some fireworks. Because Michel Delcourt is closing so quickly on this bunch. He's almost catching them now. He, 
Michel Valter has got a, a, a turbine engine and he's got more power than the other cars. So he will be able to pass the BMWs and the, uh, the Commodore on the straight. Whereas at the moment the BMWs don't have the power of the Commodore on the straight and they cannot get past under braking. So uh, Michel de Coeur, when he goes up, he will be able to pass these cars and probably climb up in the second position as the race progresses in the next half hour to hour. So Wayne Wilkinson still hanging on to that second place. Brock being challenged by Sittner there. Can't get past. Brock still third. To Sittner fourth. This is Neil Lowe fifth. Unbelievable motor racing in a Nissan Sport 500. So close. People trying so hard. It's a four hour race. And here we have Frank Sittner having a go at Peter Brock. He's got through. He'll be pleased. Neil Lowe trying to do the same thing. What a dream opening for Dick Johnson. He's just powering away in the big Ford now. And this is the sort of thing he wanted to do. He said yesterday he wants to protect the brakes of the Ford. And he's going to do it by getting out, opening a lead, and he's softening on his brakes. Neil Lowe has just got past Peter Brock. That's a replay of the passing manoeuvre. Frank Sittner getting past Peter Brock, having sat there for the previous three laps. Nicely done. Neil Lowe tried to do the same behind him. Tom Walkinshaw pulling up the advantage as well. So now Dick Johnson starting to beat some back markers and some traffic. That's Bob Holden he's getting past now, having lapped him. And he's about to lap the other Holden Commodore of Blue McKinnon, which is running on radial fire stone tires, or maybe radial donut tires. Well, Peter Brock is, oh, there's Michelle Delcourt coming past Tom Walkinshaw on power. No, he got chopped out there. Tom Walkinshaw, an experienced man. Michelle Delcourt going under braking. Oh, what a race. Fantastic. These overseas drivers are really too long. The turbo lag put Michelle Delcourt out there and he dropped 100 yards. That's a problem with turbo cars. That was almost a repeat of the situation of practice yesterday. Somebody going on the inside. And Walkinshaw going on the outside. On that occasion, he got T-boned off the track. We're moving into lapping the cars already, and that's amazing. In such a short time, these fast cars are moving through the tail enders now. And look we've, at this, three wide. A, three wide into the turn. Neil Lowe has got ahead of Frank Sittner. So Neil Lowe's car is now the tyres are warmed. It's closed right up. Peter Brock's been shoved right back out of it. This is and a traffic Lou jam. And car getting in the way. But here we have Neil Lowe ahead. Oh, Frank Sittner and Tom Walkinshaw getting up past Peter Brock now. Walkinshaw getting, squeezing him right out. Peter Brock trying to chop him out. Walkinshaw having nothing of it. Well, we have a motor race. This is unreal for a long distance race. This is the most amazingly aggressive start I've well, ever seen in yes, a long distance race. The reason why we've got the best, some of the best drivers in the world there. We, we knew these drivers were good and they're just showing us how determined and good they are. And this man, Michel de Coeur, is going to surprise us all before the day's over. Wayne Wilkinson has got Neil Lowe climbing all over him, and this is the way we've seen it in the last Group A races in New Zealand. We've become used to seeing those two cars nose to tail. And now we have a race amongst the Kiwis for second place. Well, Neil Lowe, we did a mammoth driving stint of nearly four hours the Benson Hedges race, and he uh, was the first win that uh, this BMW had in this country. He's doing a very good job of catching up to uh, Wayne Wilkinson in the black BMW as you see him. We have John Power in the pits and the Philip Commodore. That's the first official pit stop. We know that it's an unscheduled one because it's too soon for anything. But John Power and the Philip VK Commodore in the pits. Well, Wayne Wilkinson will be driving to orders. He'll be Raystone, a team manager, will be saying, don't race. Neil Lowe is out there trying very hard, doing what he did at the Benson Hedges and trying to get through and, and catch up to Dick Johnson. There's Dick Johnson through, looking back to the gap now to Wayne Wilkinson. Dick Johnson. Neil Lowe climbing all over it. Yeah, Dick but Johnson's been held up by traffic there, and that could play a big part in this race as well. For the first time in New Zealand long distance races, as I understand it, we've got communication from the pit to the drivers. So this is something that we've, uh, we're used to overseas, so the, the w people can get direct information to their drivers as it happens or when it's needed. Dick Johnson, the big Ford, the pine pack Ford, sweeping through uh, through the bridge and onto the pit straight. Now it's obviously the traffic that's lost him all that space. He had an enormous lead and getting through those black markers on a tight little street circuit like this has cost him an enormous amount of ground. And it could cost him a lot of time as the race goes on because the first person to lap the traffic usually has a harder time because the people don't notice it. We notice here Wayne Wilkinson and Neil Lowe still having a scrap. And Neil Lowe very determined to get past Wayne Wilkinson.
tremendous dice points the New Zealand for second place. And just have a look how close that gap is now. Dick Johnson really having to work very, very hard indeed in the Falcon to pull away his lead again. Oh, it all went to plan in the first couple of laps and he pulled away beautifully, but getting through the traffic has cost him that gap. He's probably lost 10 seconds, I would say, Tony. He had such a tremendous lead. It'd be at least 10 seconds he's lost. Here's Neil Lowe having to go at Wayne Wilkinson. What a tremendous scrap. This can't last. Somebody's going to go off shortly. These two don't seem to be slowing each other down too much in second place. Okay, we're on the ninth lap of the Nissan Sport 500, and now your leader, as you know, Dick Johnson in the Ford from Wayne Wilkinson fighting furiously with Neil Lowe. There we see Frank Sipner and Tom Walkinshaw. It's a very good race there for Mel Michelle Delcourt coming through in the Volvo. We expected it to go very quickly, but I don't think even this quickly was imaginable. There is the Volvo, number 11, Michelle Delcourt, the Belgian, who has come here and surprised so many people, working his way through the field. Dick Johnson getting held up even more than we've seen before. Dick Johnson going into the pits. Well, there's a problem here. The new leader is now Wayne Wilkinson. We'll find out what's happened to Dick Johnson in the pits very shortly for you. But now we have a New Zealander leading this raid. Wayne Wilkinson with Neil Lowe behind him. They're taking fuel on. A lot of people predicted this would be a stop, but not so soon. Again, the fuel is just a precaution to make sure the car is full at all times. The driver will be talking to the co-driver. The wheel changes possibly, maybe he's overheated the tyres, but we'll hear this from our pit people. Well, that means all the hard work has come to naught if he has overheated tyres. Well, we don't know. There's certainly the fuel leakage. Yes, fuel spilling from the car, maybe a burst tank. Well, the organisers will make them top that fuel up, wipe the fuel up before they're allowed to go out. So this is going to be a long fuel stop, uh, pit stop, and uh, it's going to affect their chances in the race. They're putting the front of the car up now, and maybe going to change those tyres as well. Well, this is a tragedy for Dick Johnson's chances of winning this race here. Um, their chances would now be very remote. They spent so much time in the pits. The pace is so tough, it is unlikely, unrealistic that Dick Johnson could recover from a stop like this. And his rotten luck continues. He has rotten luck at Bathurst, Rotten luck when he came to the B and H uh, earlier last, late last year, and here he is now, the pole man in the pits. The way. Okay, we just heard from the pits that the problem with that car is the rear brakes. They've lost too much time now to be competitive because out in front at this stage, Wayne Wilkinson and Neil Lowe. No. Uh, Neil Lowe has got back in the lead and Wayne Wilkinson is in second. Frank Sint is back in third place and it looks like Tom Walkinshaw would be fourth with Peter Brock in fifth place. Neil Lowe is the race leader from Wayne Wilkinson. Frank Sintner behind him, Tom Walkinshaw behind him. But the Volvo I think has got past Peter Brock as well. So here we are, have the leader. Neil Lowe and his BMW. What a tremendous start for their race. They've come from fourth in the race to into the lead. Well, Neil Lowe is regarded as the sprinter of the pair of them. Once imag um, one imagines that Kent Bajant said, Neil, you go first after your dynamite performance in the BH. You go and set the pace, and I'll pick up the pieces at the end and hopefully take it through to the checkered flag. We get another chance to have a look closely, as we did just then, to see just how hard these drivers have to work around parts of this circuit. Enormous amount of fighting the wheel. Remembering what I said in practice, this car has left-hand drive and power steer. It is ideally suited to go through tight turns like the Taranaki gate there. The tar that was a little bit of a spin there from the Phillips Commodore, but no harm out of the way of Neil Lowe, who's leading now with a comfortable gap back to Wayne Wilkinson. We must be approaching the time of the race now, David, where somebody has to start looking at what times they can stay on all day, rather than this mad race we've had at the front. Well, certainly these initial laps have been uh, exciting, but they won't be very fast while they've got such a full fuel load. We haven't been bothered with time. Now, the Volvo is fighting for the, the Volvo place with, with Tom Walkinshaw right in front of our screen. He's just gone up to second position because Tom Walkinshaw was in second, and I think now that the Volvo... Oh, there's Tom Walkinshaw in second place, Michelle Ducour in the Volvo in third place, and Frank Sinter is in fourth, and Nip Wayne Wilkinson back into fifth place. Traffic jam at the hairpin turns there, but 
Tom Walkinshaw holding his place, but he's got this turbo Volvo. You're normally used to seeing Volvo on the name of Fast Trucks. Now we have this Fast Racing Saloon, Group A Volvo, turbo power, and it's pressing Tom Walkinshaw, European Touring Car Champion. Well, the Volvo should have more power on the straight. It should be able to get past Tom Walkinshaw later on. But Tom Walkinshaw is a very determined man, and he's the British... Has the European Touring Car Group A champion, so you can expect him to not let Michel Ducar go past too easy. But he's got smoke coming out of the back of his car, so anything could be happening or going wrong with that car and giving him a problem at the moment. Michel Delcourt seems to get a little bit of oversteer. A couple of those corners there. It's a little bit tail happy, but seems to be under control. I think he's just plain excited with the way it's going. He's got so much horsepower at his disposal, and he's disposing with his field quite rapidly. He can sense that smoke coming from Tom Walkinshaw's rear end. We don't know what that is, whether it's dragging back from the engine, but it's smoking quite seriously. Now, we know that St. Johnston's had rear brake problems. In fact, it could be brake smoke from his rear end. Go down and have a word with Dick Johnson, the unluckiest man here, and see what has happened to him. Well, Dick, this is the most rotten luck possible. Still, mate, I'm getting used to it, aren't I? <laughs> That's rear brakes, we believe. Yeah, for some reason, just one minute the pedal was there, next minute was gone. I tell you, it gets pretty exciting when you end up with no brakes around here. Well, speaking of exciting, it's one hell of a race, isn't it? You could say that, because uh, you know, driving a car around here, mate, uh, you get a bit busier than a bricklayer in Beirut, I'd reckon, hey? <laughs> reckon you'll get back out there, Dick? Oh, we'll have a go, yeah, why not? Best of luck, Dick. Thanks very much. Dick Johnson, who was the fastest man on the circuit. Uh, it would have been intriguing to see if this Volvo in the hands of Michel Delcourt had had a chance to practice fully, because the way it's going on the circuit, I couldn't help but think it would have been under 133. I think Tom Walkinshaw definitely has a problem with that rover. It's not just the odd bit of smoke now. It's under power as well as the override. I think it looks like uh, it might be brakes as well because the smoke's coming out from within the left rear wheel. It might be a, an oil seal, but it could also be brakes like Dick Johnson's because these brakes are getting a hammering now that they never had in practice yesterday because the rover didn't do enough laps consistently in practice to heat the brakes up. But Michel Ducour is all over him, and he's in third place. And at the moment, he's they're not... They're, Neil Lowe isn't able to pull away from these two cars very much either. We'll try and get a word on what the problem is with Tom Walkinshaw's rover, but at the moment he's being pushed by Michelle Delcour, having a go, not quick enough there. Yeah, well, Tom Walkinshaw pushed him out there, Michelle Delcour trying to go into braking. Well, dear goodness gracious, he's had a go and he's done it for Is the turbo lag going to hold him up? Tom Walkinshaw trying to come the outside of it, but the turbo's away. Look at these street fighting men. This is the sort of stuff that street racing is all about. Taking holes in, or gaps in, in corners that don't seem to be existing there. They just force their way through. Nothing of real class. And let's look at this on replay. Michelle Delcourt taking the Volvo, taking past. Now that would definitely seem to be a rear brake problem on the Rover Ridge. It's coming out of that left rear wheel quite badly now. Yes, I think the brakes have overheated, as uh, Dick Johnson's has, but a, a marvellous manoeuvre from Michel Delcourt on a street circuit like that, a fantastic passing manoeuvre, something we would very rarely see today. But Tom Walkinshaw is a street fighter, and even though he's probably got brake problems, he's not slowing down. He's got the other BMWs that behind him and also Peter Brock but so Tom Walkinshaw is just going to press on as hard as he can go which is why he became this European saloon car champion this year, last year. The thing that intrigues me is how long the rear tyres, oh this is falling off this Volvo, how long the rear tyres on the Volvo are going to last with the amount of oversteer that he's getting. He's almost driving it like a rally car. In place I think they're using a hard compound, so it shouldn't matter too much, Tony. I just think the Sheldon Coos really taking advantage of the turbo power. In fact, the left rear bumper has obviously caught a tyre and it's just flapping about, sorry, the right rear bumper, and uh, nothing's really going to do any damage, I wouldn't think. It's probably just a plastic uh, moulding strip or something that's come adrift, and it won't be a problem with the officials because it's not a safety hazard at this stage. If it was a problem with the officials, he'd be black flagged, but as to, uh, David says, uh, that's not liable to happen for Michelle Decoeur. And Michelle Decoeur is now closing right in on Neil Lowe, our New Zealand leader. So after 14 laps, the order is Neil Lowe in the BMW, Michel Delcourt in the Volvo, an amazing drive from the back of the grid, and Tom Walkinshaw still tenuously holding that third place. This Nissan Sport 500 race has had a fantastic first 14 laps, something we never expected in here. 
highest expectations of any street race. Dick Johnson still has not rejoined the race, so we imagine the problem is taking some time to solve. Obviously, he has dropped from contention, but if he comes out, he's always good to watch on a circuit like this. One thing I would expect with the, the shift of the Volvo is that when Robbie Frenesova gets in, he's an excellent driver and he'll be keeping up this pace. So I would expect the Volvo to possibly take the lead, lead in the race later on. Here it is, the Volvo. is Peter Brock, seventh place is Paul Adams, in eighth place Gary Pedersen, but Paul Adams, the first of the 1600 class, had an amazing performance to be right up there in seventh place. Yes, ahead of the two-liter um, Fiat, Tony. We're also sure. ahead of the V6 Alfa Romeo, which we know had a lot of trouble in practice and was loaned an engine, as we told you earlier, by uh, Tim, Tim Bailey in Auckland, Continental Cars, loaned him an engine, but probably not as fast as he would have liked, not a race engine. I noticed when Tom Walkshaw went past the pits last time, he was waving to his pit crew and pointing back, and this problem is getting worse and worse. I wouldn't be surprised if it isn't a caliper but that isn't releasing the pads off the disc properly and we're getting bad uh, bra overheating brakes. Uh, but he's definitely waving at his pits, so we may see him crawl into pits later on. Well, either the oil has run out, <laughs> well, the smoke has burned out. It's certainly a lot less than it was, but oh no, there it is, back again. Well, we've heard from the pits that he's coming in in two laps, or in the next two laps, so we'll be able to find out when he gets in exactly what the problem is. Certainly, it looks like the rear left hand brake. No, that actually, the blueness that spoke actually would suggest now that it is probably oil smoke. So I, would, I, would, I would, don't think it's a brake problem. I'm fairly sure it's probably a leaking oil seal in the dip. And Tom Walkinshaw will be coming into the pits next time. But what a marvellous drive. He's got a problem with his car and he's pressing on very hard. And here we have Dick Johnson going back out onto the circuit, um, way down in the race, but trying as he did as they did the fence and the hedges. Come here to race and they're going here's to race. Wa Excuse me, Reg, but here's Wayne Wilkinson in the pit. Well, this is a surprise. He's come in here early. Uh, maybe there's something wrong with him or it's one of these strategies, but I can't understand why he's in the pits. I'm quite sure at the end of the day, everybody is going to say it was the pace at the start that really cost a lot of people their entry. Well, they haven't jacked uh, the BMW up. They're not putting in fuel. There must be some other problem. They're talking to Wayne Wilkinson. We'll find out later on what the problem is. Absolutely amazing. You walk around the pits before a race like this, and everybody will normally say, look, it's a long race. We don't want to go out hard at the start. Yes, but the you never... The start of this one, when the, when the green light went, everybody just went crazy. You don't take any notice of drivers, Tony. When they get out of there, the key goes on, and their brains go off, and they say they're going to cruise, but they never do. And in this race, they haven't. So being on the streets brings out the street racer in these drivers. Certainly these street racers with his five or six front running cars going so hard early on, it had, someone had to pay the price. But here's the old Volvo. I, won't, I shouldn't call it the old Volvo. We just think of it as the big red brick. But it's furious its way through this pack of cars and it looks reliable. And it's running in second, a good strong second position. And Frank Sittner is now in third place. As I said before, he hoped to win the race. And he's sitting looking good. He hasn't lost too much distance to Neil Lowe. Wayne Wilkinson has lost 25 seconds. They changed the right front tyre. Well, he must have hit a curb somewhere or had a puncher. That's a quick pit stop. The important news of the moment is that a New Zealander is in the lead. Neil Lowe in the Lowe Bajan BMW leads the race from yeah. Michelle Delcour in the Volvo. Tom Walkinshaw in the Rover still third and Frank Sittner fourth. Well, of course, what, what Neil Lowe will be aiming to do in his team now, they've got a bit of a breather. We know that they've got the Volvo closing on them, but now their race plan will be in operation. The initial heat will have gone off. They'll be aiming for a pit stop at around about, say, 70 laps, 75 laps. I mean, that's half distance. We're uh, uh, racing uh, the distance of 150 laps. Now, all the drivers who have stopped, their race plans have to be re-altered because they've had fuel off all, and they've had tyres, and they have to rewrite their race plan. But Neil Lowe running according to plan. One of the questions that uh, 
I haven't yet been able to find the answer to, they're a bit reluctant to tell us, is what the gas consumption is like on that Volvo being a turbo. Uh, they've got a 120 litre tank in there and talking to them before, I think they only expect to make one fuel stop with a short race. Had it been the long race, um, I would have expected to have two fuel stops, but from what I understand it's only going to be one, but um, they don't know the fuel consumption either because they've changed the diff ratio, as you said, from 3.2 to 3.9, so the fuel consumption will go up, so they've got their plans, but they could be uh, not what they expect them to be yet. We'll get some time for you as quickly as possible on that Volvo and see exactly what they're so cruising around at. Cruising is probably the wrong word for it. The pace in the initial stages of this, this is Ford 500, has been absolutely astonishing. Talking about the other turbo car, behind uh, Michelle Del Cur at the moment is a Nissan Bluebird turbo, which is one of the other uh, three turbo cars in this race and one we will see more of later on. We're on lap 18 of the Nissan 500. Remember, 150 laps expected. And Peter Brock told us that he's expecting to do 75, 76 laps and stop for gas. Peter Brock, of course, dropping back from the main pack, but it's an endurance race, as we said earlier. He's pacing himself. He's still handily placed, but don't be confused. Dick Johnson is right out of this contest. He must have lost a good four or five laps but he's got his old batter sparring partner right in front of him. Well, these two Australians will be having a lot of fun together now, and uh, Peter Brock won't be likely passed by Dick Johnson, but Dick Johnson will be getting a great buzz out of doing this at the moment. I disagree, Rich. I think that Peter will be happy to let Dick get out of the way. If Dick's going to go at the speed that he was in practice, Neil Lowe is in the pits. Well, an, an early pit stop for uh, Neil Lowe as well. Well, it's all happening fast and furious here. And now the Volvo has taken the lead in the race. Seems like nobody is exempt from the pit stops in this race. And I'm sure at the end of the day, there are going to be a lot of people saying, what did that crazy pace at the, at the front of the race cost us? Well, Frank Sittner's story about that he can win this race is starting to come true because he's now uh, moved up because of the retirement. So he's in second place. So... Uh, Michelle Ducur and Frank Sintner are looking very good now. Remember, we've got Tom Walker expecting to come into the pits. He, he signaled the pits on his way on his way by last time, so he's going to be an expected visitor soon. Now, under the bonnet of the Rover, looking, I, there's no labels there, boys, to say what's wrong. You've just got to figure it out. They're down the front of the engine, and it looks like they're looking at maybe the oil seals that are leaking or whatever that's causing that smoke. It could be a front crankshaft seal or a rocket cover gasket, something of that nature. Well, obviously, they're worried. There's not an immediate answer to the problem. They've already it's, lost over a minute. It's, it's a long pit stop. Um, this is costing them uh, possibly their fifth victory in Group A races on a trot in this country. So uh, we have the Volvo out in the lead and uh, Frank Sittner, Englishman, sitting right there, and Tom Walkinshaw as well, so. Remember we have these BMWs controlled by a little computer and going back to the beginning of the BNH series, which was held late last year, that problem put this car out of the lead of one of the races it was in. And if it's an electrical problem with something involved with uh, the computer, they're definitely in trouble. But there seems to be a fellow standing there with a water can. I don't know whether that's to add oil or water. He's going out anyway, rejoining the race. Well, the first race they had was at Manfield, and the computer stopped them there. Well, that's cost them, and they're going to have to come back for fuel and tyres later on, so their chances of winning, a, unless the others drop out, are becoming remote. At the moment, the race order after 20 laps. Michelle Delcour in the Volvo first on 20 laps. Tom Walkinshaw on the Rover second on 20 laps. Frank Sidner is also on 20 laps in third place. Peter Brock is fourth now on 20 laps. And then go back to Neil Lowe and the BMW on 19 laps. Wayne Wilkinson on 19 laps. Paul Adams on 19 laps. So Paul Adams is doing amazingly well on the little, little Toyota Corolla. Tail end Charlie at this point is Chris Heyer in the Audi five cylinder that's uh, made like that with five cylinders. Not, it has, it's not a six cylinder that's lost one, but uh, now that smoke is really getting heavy from Tom Walker's John's car. Yes, I'm fairly sure it's all smoke too, because when I went past the pits last time, it didn't smell like crazy. Walker's sure a tremendous street fighter. He, his car's oversteering badly, being able to press on and stay in second position with all that oil on the tyres. is a marvellous driving. 
which is something that we've never seen in this country before, a man doing this and keeping the second position against this company. Oh, Tom Warbishaw is having a, a hard time driving this car. Neil Lowe seems to be circulating quite well. The car sounds fine. Maybe it was a, maybe an oil pressure problem. He was worried the oil pressure was a bit low. We know that uh, he wouldn't want to damage one of those super expensive German engines. And Michelle Delcour has just passed Bob Holden in the Toyota Sprinter, which they uh, borrowed engines and changed last night in a mammoth effort. Uh, these people here had trouble yesterday in the Toyota Sprinter behind, and they changed engines overnight after borrowing one from a New Zealand person. So it's uh, the, the very determined teams that are here at this, this 500 street race. To give you an idea of the effort that was put in to get that Volvo to New Zealand, the entrance for the car, Mark Petch and uh, the SKF people, reportedly created $25,000 worth of air bills to bring the car from Europe, especially for the event, and that only got it to Auckland. And then the organizers of the event had to pay another $6,000 to put it on a Bristol freighter and bring it down in time for the last practice session yesterday. But it looked to be all worthwhile as this car, the Volvo number 11, is leading the Nissan Sport 500. Now we have an unofficial lap time, which was very interesting reading. One minute, 31 seconds. That's a full one and a half seconds faster than the quickest pole time of Dick Johnson. There is no way any car on the circuit can go as fast as this car. 1.31 is a fantastic time. And it's We've seen all the other cars in their two time practice sessions. We've seen them in the flying lap competition. And the fastest time was 132.49. Dick Johnson's the only man who went under 133. And now we have this Volvo with virtually no preparation circulating at 131 in the race. Yes, but it was used in the European uh, sl Group A saloon car championship, so it's very well set up. They knew what tyres to use. They went for a control tyre and they said it would keep. Cons uh, lapping at the same laps for the whole day once the tyres warmed up to settle down and it, they said it would take approximately 10 laps for this to happen and now that it's warmed up it's away and gone and it's certainly not a car going to touch the Volvo so long as it's running Dick Johnson back out on the circuit but he's a couple of laps down when we have these pit stops like we now have had the Wilkinson Brighton Fox a BMW in the pit. We've had the Neil Lowe invasion car in the pit. Dick Johnson in the pit. And the only one in the front bunch that probably hasn't at this point, or the only two uh, that we've been watching on your screen, are the Volvo, Peter Brock, and Frank Sittner. Tom Walkinshaw also hasn't been in the pits, but uh, we'd expect him to go there very shortly. How the man is controlling this car with that oil smoke everywhere is uh, amazing. Here's Peter Brock. Peter Brock would look for, like to be a bit further up the front of this race, but he's lapping consistently and still got a good chance of winning because the pace was so hot in the first 20 laps that uh, the car's reliability for the end of the race could be in question. Just run through the places quickly. They'll call the Volvo, Walkinshaw, Rover, Sittner, BMW, Brock, Holden, Brighton, BMW, Bajan, BMW. And then we get into the baby cars, as we call them, but the very fast baby cars, Paul Adams in the Toyota, Ahead of Gary Pedersen in the Fiat Ritmo, Ray Golson in his Alpha, a terrific effort with his engine loan from Auckland brought down overnight. Then Barry in the Fiat, Willie in the Toyota, Kevin Ryan in the Nissan Turbo, one of the Belvin brothers in his Holden Commodore, one, McGregor in his VW, and Chris Heyer bringing up the N in the Audi. While you've been reading out the results, David, I've been watching Tom Walkinshaw, and that smoke appears to have disappeared a bit. I would say that the, the uh, level of oil in the diff is uh, dropping to a level... Uh, oh, no, I'm making a lie. I mean, now has, he must come into the pit to just keep that. Tom Walkinshaw, that's really bad luck for him. He's holding on to the car very well, but he's obviously not circulating at the right kind of lap time. And he's going to have to come into the pits at some stage. He signaled his pits a couple of laps ago that he would be in. He's just looking at him going past the pits now, and he's waving to them as if there's nothing wrong. Well, he's, he's doing 1 minute 33 laps. It's a pretty good lap time. And I notice his brake lights are on all the time. It could actually be a brake problem, David. 
colour we can't figure out. Normally, brake fluid has a white colour to it, and the blue that we're seeing here is more associated with dip oil. Let's see if we can cross now to the pits with the... Uh, no, in fact, we can't get a camera at this moment, but uh, the oil smoke is obviously uh, not causing a problem to his lap time, and that's why he's reluctant to stop. But obviously, any fluid that's causing a smoke, which is burning, it could run out. Now, if it's diff oil, we presume he's got something like two or three litres in that diff. It could very well be coming from the diff breather. If it's, he could well have overfilled the diff in order to preserve the life of the uh, gears in there. But it's so excessive, that smoke, that it can't possibly go on. Well, I would, I would imagine he'll get black flag before terribly long. Uh, one thing about Tom Walkinshaw, he's done a lot of long distance races and he knows that it, it, coming into the pits is a waste of time and you just keep driving your car and that's obviously what he's going to do. He knows there's a problem, but he's not coming in until the car stops. But I am still can't understand why his brake lights are on. That's uh, got me a bit amazed. Okay, we've just heard from the pits that they don't know what the problem is, they can't guess at it, and Tom Walkinshaw is waving them the OK sign as he comes past the pits each time. Well, we'll take a wild stab in the dark at the moment and say that it may be, as Reggie said earlier, the brake, rear brakes are binding, and in fact what we're seeing is brake smoke. The brakes are huge and they will last a lot longer than Dick Johnson's would under the similar punishment. Remember that Dick told us yesterday the Ford brakes are in standard form, uh, whereas these cars are running the allowable modification Group A brakes, which are huge. The discs are about 12 or 13 inches diameter and huge four-part brake cover. I think it is brakes, Dave, because after he's done a hard braking, you notice then you get a lot of smoke, and then the disc probably not the pads off, and uh, then the smoke stops. So I notice the smoke is usually after he's braked hard, but even though he's got big brakes, they're not going to last for four hours. They must be wearing out. Now look at the bumper on the rear of the Frank Sittner car, the one that's in the rear of your picture there, car six. The bumper's flapping around on the rear, so he's obviously caught a, a tire or an obstacle on the street circuit. But the Volvo is suffering from the same complaint, but eventually I'm sure it'll just waggle its way off and drop off. And this is a battle for second and third with Tom Walkinshaw second, and the number, car number two, the Drover 3.5 ahead of Car number six, Frank Sittner from England in the BMW. And Frank Sittner, I'd say, would be looking at uh, the rover and saying, well, I can pass you shortly with all that smoke coming out. And Frank's setting himself up to take over second place in the race. And they're going to get held up now by Lou McKinnon and the Commodore. Well, mainly I'm impressed with the standard of the New Zealand drivers in moving over for the fast cars. We've seen no incidents that we know of that have caused... Now, there's a tight manoeuvre. Frank Sitton has just gone into second place ahead of Tom Walkinshaw and will be very pleased. Well, we... we hear from the pit crew, Frank, uh, Tom Walkinshaw's pit crew, that they think the oil is coming from a gearbox leak and just leaking onto the exhaust. It still doesn't explain why the rear brake lights are on on that rover. That shouldn't be happening, so it's uh, be interesting to hear at the end of the race what the actual problem really was, Tony. We're at lap 28 of this 150-lap uh, race. After 26 laps, Michelle Delcour in the Volvo on 26. Tom Walkinshaw, the Rover, on 26. He's just been passed by Frank Sittner. So Sittner second, Walkinshaw third, both of them on 26 laps. Peter Brock in the Holden in fourth place on 26. And then come back to Wayne Wilkinson in fifth place on 25 laps. Neil Lowe in sixth place on 25 laps. And a further lap down to seventh place, Paul Adams in the Toyota, the first of the 1600 class, and the first of the up to 2.5 litre class is Gary Pedersen in the Fiat, in eighth place on 25 laps also. Now the bonnet has just broken loose on the front of the Volvo. Being a front opening bonnet, that could be a real hazard. Yes, there's a bit of a problem there. I can see them having to come into pits and putting some of our famous thousand mile tape on it. It's got one of those clips on it and it's unscrewed, so it'll take more than a couple of seconds to fix that problem. In fact, it's one of the safety pin type arrangements which are supposed to be foolproof and bulletproof. It looks like it's actually broken it right out of the chassis and it's flapping completely on the bonnet. Now, this is the fastest part of the track. Let's watch and see what the wind does to the bonnet. Yeah, so it won't do too many laps like that because eventually it'll weaken and uh, it'll buckle up in front even though it's held by its condition. 
I would think even if they uh, weren't thinking of breaking into the pits themselves, the flag marshals would have something to say about it. There's to be a bungee cord going on that, I would say. Well, that, if that car comes into the pits, that will probably leave Bob Walkinshaw and Frank Sittner fighting for the lead. The two Englishmen. Frank Sittner will be comfortably in the lead then. Well, we believe that the Rover is going to come into the pit at the same time as the Volvo, so we'll try and watch this action. But that will leave, as we say, Frank Sittner, car number six, the Volvo in the lead. The Volvo, sorry, the BMW, but the Volvo's appearing to fall to bits. And the bonnet flapping at one end and the rear bumper flapping at the other. And he's, he's only, as we say, now 29 laps into the event. Well, he's not coming in this lap round. Okay, let's have a look at the highlights of this race so far. A race that everybody expected to be like any other long distance race, but one that started with an absolutely amazing, aggressive driving from a wonderful field of international drivers. Nick Johnson out of the lead, coming through on the inside, Peter Brock in third place, right in second. A great little battle in the air. That's a simple, simple enough problem to fix provided the engine will stay cool enough while it's in the pits. Yes, they've got a problem uh, the, uh, when the engine stopped. It's obviously boiled and overheating. You can see the antifreeze being pushed out everywhere. They're trying to fix the bonnet pin problem and keep the engine cool while it's sitting there. But we have in the lead now Frank Sittner. So uh, <laughs> tremendous changes going on in this race in such a short period of time. Well, let's not forget that in second place now is Peter Brock. And that's a very handy spot for Peter Brock to be in. He said that he wants to just cruise around uh, and just as well, should we say, cruise around Peter Brock style is pretty fast for anyone else. But uh, he, very close moment there for Frank Sittner and the, the tail end Charlie there, one of the tail end Charlies, a little Toyota there. Dave Jane. Dave Jane it is. But uh, no doubt, no trouble there. Frank Sittner will probably leave passing him now until they get through to the pit straight. Yes, Frank Sittner being very badly balked there. It's, uh, it's a bit of a shame he's lost a lot of time in that big balk like that. But what we'll be watching for is then with interest now, Frank Sittner in the lead and Peter Brock in second place. It's going to be a battle of teamwork and half distance remembering that uh, five seconds, ten seconds, one in the pit is a hell of a lot easier than ten seconds on the track. Now look at this Volvo, they're trying to pull the engine a little bit before they add water. They're actually pouring it over the radiator to try and uh, just skip the surface cooling. The, the car, while it's sat there, it boiled and it's pushed towards water out, so they've got to cool it enough so they can take the radiator cap off and refill it up. I would think that's why they haven't got out in the circuit. The bonnet pin problem, I'm sure they fixed that already, but they've got to cool the engine to... Uh, be able to take the radiator cap off with safety and um, I wouldn't want to be uh, standing around when they do that. Well, turbo cars of course generate fantastic heat in the exhaust system. They're obviously fixing the bonnet problem at the same time as trying to get the water in but lost a tremendous amount of time. Robbie Francovic there throwing in his advice. He's concerned obviously. Some officials pointing underneath the car now there's another problem maybe here. Well, this is a great shame. They made such a tremendous effort to get out to this race. They came out here, uh, started from the back row of the route, get into the lead, and a small problem like a bonnet pin is taking the chances of winning a race. I mean, that means a very simple thing. Those bonnet pins only worth a dollar fifty, and here they are, out of a potential winning of our first Group A Nissan Sport Street Race. And just about to tie it down with a piece of wire. Yes. Looks like you've got on number eight wire, John Tony. Yes, I think they going to have to use a bit of Kiwi ingenuity there, I'd say. What, what we are amazed at in our commentary position is that the fantastic effort that goes into bringing these cars from overseas for a $20,000 race, $20,000 to win this race, and they don't seem to be able to go 30 laps. Okay, Michelle, no, Michelle Delcour back out on the circuit now, officially in fifth place at a lap down after the pit stop. So Frank Sittner, the race leader, Peter Brock in second place. Frank Sittner with a lap up on Peter Brock. Then Wayne Wilkinson in third on the same lap as Peter Brock. On that same lap of 31 is Neil Lowe in fourth place. And then go back to lap 30, Michelle Delcour, Gary Pedersen, uh, Dave McMillan out there at the moment, I think. 
Gary Pedersen it is out on the fence. Tom Walkinshaw in seventh place, then Paul Adams in eighth place. One of the best racing results for Gary Pedersen so far to be in the top six against this field was fairly unrealistic, but Gary's been working away for two or three weeks to make sure that this car is super reliable, a little Genco Fiat. And uh, of course, he'll be handing over at half distance to single-seater driver Dave McMillan. Going back to the uh, Volvo, it's two laps down, but at the pace that it was going, it's still got a chance of catching up and getting back in the lead if they have no more trouble from the bonnet pin and the overheating that was caused in the pits, because the overheating in the pits could have damaged the head gasket. So it'd be interesting to see whether they any problems come about that car later on. Certainly, if the motor is still sound, they were lapping quickly enough and obviously capable of quick enough laps to get back in the lead. It's not unrealistic at all. No, and. I have to say now, Frank Sittner said to me last night when I was at the hotel with him that he'd win this race because his car would be there at the end, and at the moment, that looks exactly what he's doing. So Frank Sittner, the race leader in the BMW. BMWs at this stage, first, second, and third. Sittner first, Wayne Wilkinson second, and Neil Lowe third. So BMW 635 CSIs, there are only three of them in the race. They are first, second, and third. Peter Brock has moved back to fourth place. Frank Sittner just going by the Belper Brothers Holden Commodore and Paul Adams in a little Toyota. Paul Adams, of course, driving with Alan Wolfe, his father-in-law. Great motor racing pair in New Zealand. Paul Adams and Alan Wolfe. This is Paul Adams in the Toyota number 71 Red Corolla, as you see it. This is the same car that he rallies and he uses in the international rally. Well, we have it unofficially as in the lead of the Fiat, although our computer is telling us that uh, Gary Pedersen is in fact in the lead in that baby class, but here is the leader of the category, up to three litres, the Toyota Corolla of Paul Adams. Toyota Corolla is in the 1600 class, so that's an amazing performance to be up there beating two and a half litre cars. But the, the Toyota Corolla is a, is a new generation Japanese Group A motor car, and when we see the new generation Japanese Group A motor cars in bigger engines, uh, not only will they lead this class, I think they'll be leading the other classes as well. It's only a matter of time in this race next year we should hopefully have Tom three Walkinshaw. cars. Tom Walkinshaw. Tom Walkinshaw has stopped. Obviously, whatever the problem was, it has got worse. He thought he could keep circulating instead of coming into the pits. He's given his crew a wave each time around. And there he is, stationary. Well, Tom Walkinshaw pitted, went out of the circuit, got going again. But if he's lost oil out of the diff of the gearbox, it could have overheated the, in the diff or the gearbox and either broken either crown wall pinion or the gears in the gearbox. And it's a tragedy to see Tom Walkinshaw like this. They had a problem in the bathurst with an accident in the first starting, the first start at the bath. And here he is standing on the side. He drove brilliantly in uh, practice yesterday, but got uh, pushed out of it, and he hasn't had a good weekend at all. I think that's the end of the road for Tom Walkinshaw. The 1984 European Group A saloon, saloon car champion parked on the side of the road. We're not very happy and having to walk home. Well, he's given his best. Now, while we officially have BMW's first, second, and third. It is worth talking about the difference between the three of them. Frank Sittner in your picture there is the race leader. Second place is Wayne Wilkinson in the Wilkinson Crichton BMW, and in third place is Neil Lowe in the Major Lowe BMW. Ron All of them walking back to the pits from the Rover. In fact, Paul Walkinshaw must have handed over to him to give him a drive, and uh, the lonely walk back from Australian driver Ron Dixon who has been a very good uh, competitor in Bathurst racing and touring car racing in Australia. And it's a sad way for him to end his race after only a few laps, but at least he did get some laps, and he'd be happy about that. I wonder if Tom Walkinshaw knew something when he handed over the drive. Well, they probably did. They probably thought, at least go and do a few laps, and if it breaks, it breaks, and that's what they've done. They probably knew the car wasn't going to finish, and they gave Ron Dickinson the chance of doing a few laps before uh, next weekend at Pukekohe. Well, we'll see if we can get a word in the pits very shortly with Tom Walkinshaw and see exactly what the problem was. Tom Walkinshaw, I'm sure, will be a disappointed man. He doesn't seem to have a lot of luck down under. Yesterday, he was punted off the track in practice. Uh, of course, you remember the start of the XJ12 and the start of Bathurst, where he never got past that line. Not a lot of luck down under for Tom Walkinshaw. What a shame for the European Group A Touring Car Champion. Paul Adams going past a little 
Audi AD. Chris Heyer, in fact, in his Audi Piper sponsored uh, Audi five cylinder. It has raced the Bathurst, but mainly in class positions. Hasn't been up there mixing it with Peter Brock, but uh, passed by the flying Toyota, Paul Adams. And that certainly is setting up the little car performance of the race. Paul Adams and this fantastic little Toyota. Of course, the Audi is in the two and a half litre class and Paul Adams is in the 1600 class. So yes. Paul Adams not only winning his own class, but the one above as well. In actual fact, according to our computer, Paul Adams has lapped the Audi uh, two laps already in this race. It's two laps ahead. So um, it's a weak power Paul there. Adams in fifth place at this point. Gary Pedersen in sixth. So those two little cars are doing a very good job. Paul Adams in fifth place overall in a Group A field of this caliber. That is an amazing performance. Gary Pedersen in this Fiat in sixth place. Del is back in the seventh. Well, Paul Adams will find that by winning $4,000 from this sort of race that it's more lucrative than his rallying performance. Okay, let's go down to the pits and have a word with the team manager of the Wilkinson Crichton BMW race zone. Ray, you must be, the BMWs are going fantastically. Why are these cars so incredibly reliable? Well, they're built for long distance races. This is a very, very hard circuit, and I think the reliability has been built into the cars in the preparation. There's an awful lot of preparation goes under these particular cars, isn't there? Yes, oh, there is. Yeah. You know, a race like this, 500 kilometers around a circuit like this, is gonna do so much havoc to all the equipment, the suspension, the brakes, the engine, the transmission, that you just have to prepare them right. Of course, we saw your car run earlier. What was that for, right? Well, I think Wayne went a little bit wide there and, and smocked the curb with his right front wheel. The tire deflated, and that's what he was into. When are you going to bring him in for uh, fuel? In the tank? We're just waiting for the pattern of the race to develop a little bit, and there is no pattern at all. There's cars coming in and out of the pits like crazy. Um, about halfway, perhaps a little bit further. You'll change drivers then, too? Yes, we'll do fuel drivers, a full set of tyres, and unless we see the car before, that's what we're doing. Obviously, you'd be pretty happy if you could get through this event with just tyres and fuel. Obviously, we'd be pretty happy just to get through this event. Well, Ray, let's hope it all goes well for you. All right, thanks very much. Ray Stone, the team manager of the Wilkinson Crichton BMW that you're looking at on the picture there, currently in second place, just half a lap down on Frank Sittner in a similar car and ahead of Neil Lowe in a similar car. Peter Brock still fourth. Michelle Delcour has come on to the computer rankings again and is fifth, putting Paul Adams down in sixth place. Must remember that the Bajan, who's behind Crichton, came into the pits and lost about a minute 20 initially, whereas the Crichton uh, Wilkinson car only lost about 25 seconds in their pit stop to change the right front tyre, which was a very quick pit stop. There's Peter Brock, the master of saloon car driving, the man rated by Australians as the best saloon car driver in the world, but then probably Australians aren't very objective about it. There's a little Fiat there, number 31. I think that's the Barry in Trittier spot. Barry in the Fiat Ritmo parked on the side down by the bridge there. So there's another little retirement problem or a mechanical problem. He's, uh... We can't tell. He's got something in his hand. Now that's the walkie-talkie man, the safety man. Yes. So he's been told to move it, mate. Get rid of that car. It's either in a dangerous spot, possibly. He was in 11th place. Bob Barry's co-driver in this event is uh, Rob Whitehouse. but still circulating nicely and with an excellent co-driver could still win this race. Let's go down to the pits again and get a word with the 1984 European Touring Car Champion Tom Walkinshaw, not just ready at the moment. We'll go down there shortly. Meanwhile, Peter Brock still circulating around in fourth place. Michelle Delcourt catching him quickly in fifth and then Paul Adams sixth. Right, Tom Walkinshaw ready to talk to us now. Let's find out what happened. Well, Tom, we saw you bring the rover in or out there on the track. What's the smoke trailing out of it? What was the problem? Well, it looks like it cracked. It must have cracked the gearbox casing yesterday, not shunt, because uh, once it's really warmed up, the oil starts to pour out the gearbox, and uh, just ran the gearbox dry, and I brought it in to put more oil on it, but it's obviously stopped the circuit now. It's pretty tough luck after coming all this way, Tom. Yeah, the guys have worked their tails off, really, uh, since the, the car had that accident yesterday, and... Uh, you know, I feel bad for them, really. 
it was a pretty exciting race there for the opening lap though wasn't it yeah it was quite good fun to be in it so i hope the crowd enjoyed it it was certainly good fun to be in it what about this style of street racing do you still like it oh surely you know it's hard work but uh, it's good fun be back next year tom well if we're, if we're invited back we'll certainly come back we've enjoyed it Tom Walkinshaw talking there to Graham Booth in the pits. Bad luck for them. That sounds like a perfectly reasonable explanation. In the big shunt yesterday, if they got a hairline crack in a gearbox casing, it would take a while till the gearbox got warm for that oil to start to leak. Well, sometimes with a crack, when it's cold, you don't get it. When it's hot, it opens up because the way uh, aluminium expands. And they said that they weren't going to change the gearbox, but they were going to check it. And there's Michelle Del Kerr having a bit of a moment there. And his bonnet's lifted up again, so he might lose some more time in the pits, which would be uh, a bit of a shame because he looks like coming back as being our leader as the race progresses again. Seems like that piece of number eight fencing why didn't last terribly long. Uh, it wasn't put on by a farmer, I don't think. I'll have to bring my uh, fencing uh, pliers down with me to fix that one, I think. Dick Johnson in the pits again and really out of contention, Dick Johnson. Now he's overall in 19th place and uh, seven or, hold on, I'll add it up, about 11 laps down on the leader. This the race leader, of course, is still Frank Sittner. From Neil Lowe, from uh, Neil Lowe in third place, Frank Sittner is first, Wayne Wilkinson second. 39 laps completed by Frank Sittner, 39 by Wayne Wilkinson, 39 by Neil Lowe, 38 by Peter Brock, 37 for Michelle Dalcour, and 37 for Paul Adams. Well, Frank Sittner now has a real problem with that bumper. It is a safety hazard now. And the organizers probably will be looking very seriously at that because if that came off in front of a following car, it could be very dangerous indeed. Now, it's going to work its way backwards and forwards and uh, eventually break, but uh, hopefully soon so that it doesn't cause the men with the black flag to come running out. I don't know, David. It's usually been the case whenever we say that well, we understand that the Volvo gave it a bit of a nudge uh, on the last lap at the uh, foul house hairpin, as we call it. And uh, whilst there's no apparent serious damage, that bumper is certainly uh, well adrift at this point. Normally when we watch these things, David, we say they're going to black flag a car, but they never seem to do it. So whilst uh, possibly it should be black flagged, I'd be surprised if it is, and they'll probably fix it at their, next, uh, at their scheduled fuel stop, which won't be that far away. BMWs must be showing their superiority in long distance type racing. They may not be the fleetest when uh, the race starts, but as these cars lie around, like the Rover parked over there, and as Dick Johnson either in or out of the pits with brake trouble, we know that the BMWs at this point are first, second, and third. The Volvo, which is back in fifth place, uh, we cannot blame the uh, car for its problem. It is an external thing that's been put on in terms of a bonnet and that's caused it to be back in the first place. Here we have Neil Lowe's BMW coming right up behind Crichton, who's second. Yes, it's Wayne Wilkinson driving in second place, with Neil Lowe slowing to close in on it again and uh, hoping to pass him, which he did earlier in the race, we saw. So it'll only be a matter of time, I think, before Neil Lowe passes Wayne Wilkinson. So the order still, Frank Sittner in the BMW, Wayne Wilkinson second in the BMW, Neil Lowe third in the BMW, all of them on 40 laps, Peter Brock in the hold on 40 laps now, Michelle Delcour on 39, Gary Patterson in the Fiat on 38, the first of the two and a half litre class, Paul Adams the first of the 1600 class, uh, is in seventh place on 39 laps also, then go back to Ray Goldson and the Alpha on 37. Steve Willey in the Toyota on 37. Kevin Ryan in the Nissan Turbo on 37. And the VW of the McGregors on 36 laps. Well, I have to say this, Tony. This is very similar to the Wilkinson, Lowe, Bage and Crichton battles all year. They had a battle early on in the race. They pit, and here they're having another battle. Second and third. Uh, position being squabbled over. It's been like this for the last three months that we've been covering uh, Group A motor racing on television. The strange aspect of that, Reg, is that we expected when the overseas drivers came here with their expensive machinery and team that the two locals might get blitzed. Well, it's not happening and the two locals are doing what they know best, having a good 
tussle on the circuit. And uh, it looks like the Neil Lowe car is uh, a bit quicker than the Wilkerson car. And uh, it'll be just a matter of a few laps before he gets past ahead of Wilkerson. In fact, a brilliant braking manoeuvre, and he nearly got right past him there. Oh, well. That's what we call it in field, a hairpin complex. It's a difficult corner, and uh, Neil Lowe tried to take second place there, but didn't achieve it. These two have raced against each other and close to each other so many times this year uh, that they know the capabilities of the other's car. They just really seem to love racing against each other. It almost came off that for Neil Lowe, but not quite. Yes. Wayne Wilkinson just holding onto the line and getting it right for the next corner. So Neil Lowe having to drop back behind him. I think Wayne Wilkinson braked a bit late there, so he'll be a bit careful the next lap round. Going into the infamous bridge complex. Luckily, the bridge hasn't been blocked yet, but it could happen later on today. Just an update in the baby class. Gary Patterson has now passed Paul Adams and taken over the place that he had, which was uh, fifth by our reckoning. We're checking this. The computer is running a little bit behind at the moment. But in fact, Gary Patterson, the fair Britmo, ahead of Paul Adams. No, it's still pressurizing Wayne Wilkinson very hard indeed. And I just hope Wayne Wilkinson and Neil Lowe, neither of them make a mistake in this racing situation in the long distance race. It's surprising how willing these drivers are to race each other when all they've got to do is finish. Really equivalent motor cars and two drivers that seem to trust each other very, very well. Yes, well, the uh, Wilkinson had his 25 second pit stop before. Here's Neil Lowe having another go. Is he going to make it? No, on the outside of the corner for the next one. Two laps in a row, he's tried it. Neil Lowe would have to find some other place to pass Wayne Wilkinson. Aren't these cars handling the bumps very, very well? That's what I can't really surprise about. I haven't seen any locking up brakes or which anything like that from the BMWs on this rough circuit. It's surprising they don't appear to have a lot of suspension travel, but they seem to be coping with the bumps and the off-camera and everything very yes, well. Yes, it is. It's not like we expected at all. Lowe gets incredibly close going into this bridge complex. He's just pitching for a way to get past. If they don't touch shortly, I'll be surprised. Look at Neil Lowe, all over the back of Wayne Wilkinson. Well, we can't, uh, we can't give you this officially, but Peter Brock's crew are holding out a board that he's in second place. Now, we know that, in fact, these two BMWs had pit stops. We weren't able to time the duration from our stream point. They were 1 minute 45 approximately for the, uh, the Neville Crichton entry, which is equivalent to a full lap. And I do know that Peter Brock is doing laps of 1 minute 33, 1 minute 34. So it does seem logical that he is holding his place since he has to stop. But we'll have to wait for confirmation of this when the computer update comes through. Now Here's Peter Frank. Brock is in fact saying that he's three seconds behind Frank Sittner in second place. That's on the board right now. But according to the according to the official system of lap scoring, uh, Peter Brock is in fourth place and a lap down on Neil Lowe. Frank Sipner's bumper is dragging on the ground, but obviously not slowing him down. Driving very, very smoothly. Frank Sipner, 40 years old from England, a bachelor and a man who really loves his motor racing. We know that he does uh, extremely well in the English class of uh, Group A racing and uh, owns a very big BMW dealership. Got together with Johnson BMW in Auckland and Metro Magazine to run with John Morton over here for the, Met the Nissan Sport 500. Now we're just waiting to get confirmation from Peter Brock's crew, his pit crew, who will know the exact position. And certainly they feel that Peter Brock is in second place. Frank Sittner still trailing that piece of bumper hanging off the back of the car. It's going to break off sometime. He's uh, very aggressive, Tony. He's uh, touched a few curves and touched a few tyres. And if he wants to win this race, he better not uh, keep doing this. Frank Sittner still circulating around a good consistent lap time. Just confirming Groppy's pit board again. He's showing lap 45 completed. And 1 minute 35.2, his last lap, P2. So, uh, well, we uh, 
We're sorry that we can't confirm this for you, but uh, street racing does this when cars stop very quickly in the first one hour or so. You tend to lose a little bit of uh, placing uh, reality or relativity. But we do know that Frank Sipner, the man on your screen now, is leading this event. Yes, Peter Brock's team certainly holding out P2, indicating he is in second place. And just a few seconds behind Frank Sipner. One third of the race completed now. 150 laps total, and we have confirmation Peter Brock is in second place. He's now minus two seconds on Frank Sipner. Now, this is a really interesting development because remember that uh, John Morton, who is down to drive the Frank Sipner car as the second driver, the co-driver, hasn't had that much experience in this car. He's only had a few laps of familiarization at Manfield, where he proved to be as fast as uh, Frank Sipner. But Frank Sittner driving a pace race at this moment. He's not trying to get into a fight with anyone. But this man, Peter Brock, certainly wants to fight with someone. And I would say he's, he's aiming for the lead. Quietly confident that he can get onto the back of the Sittner car. We think that he changed from his Avon tyres to Dunlop just before the start of the event. And there's supposed to be a special design tyre for the Holton Commodore. A very low profile. Dunlop Racing tyre, which he hasn't actually had very much mileage on. Probably took a few laps at the start of the race to get used to, and now he's uh, benefiting from some of the retirement, but certainly he's pressing what we understand is the place at the moment. First place is uh, Frank Littner, and Peter Brock, we understand, to be fighting for that lead. Now there's Dick Johnson going very slowly round in the Pine Pack Falcon, having a reoccurrence probably of the problems that knocked him out of the lead earlier on a great start by dick but uh great trouble set him back he's been in and out of the pits at least three times so not figuring in our result we, uh, initially when i picked my favorite it was Brock and perkins because of their pairing as a driver and it certainly uh, appeared that way even though the car isn't as quick as the others peter brock is a very good driver and larry perkins when he gets in and takes over he'll be driving just as quick and it appears that the engine problem they had in terms of camshafts and rockers and other problems they had yesterday in practice no longer there so th what the work the team did overnight which is a credit to them is paid right off and the car is circulating consistently in second place and keeping close contact with Frank Sittner who is driving very hard and if he's not careful he'll end up uh, bending a wheel or getting a puncher. We can tell you I think officially now that the computer is hemorrhaged because in fact it's showing Neville Crichton is leading the event and no way can we see that he has passed him on the circuit. Tony Palmer has come back with the news update. Yes, Peter Brock definitely in second place. With Frank Sinton definitely in first. Well, this is a, a great turn of events. Uh, obviously, the informality of the whole street racing scene has just taken a few of our uh, computer lap scorers by surprise. But uh, we've still got a terrific race on because to Holden fans, this is what they wanted to see. Their man, Peter Brock, making it an attempt to break the dominance of BMWs in Group A type racing. Remembering this is the debut for this UDC Finance Holden VK Commodore. And second place, fighting for the lead, cannot be bad for Peter Brock and the Larry Perkins co-driven car. I think the thing we find surprising about this, Tony, is we're a third of the way through the This Is Sport 500 race, and we've got a, a race still going on. It's not coasting to the end. It's, it's an out-and-out scrap between two overseas drivers. Actually, it's been that way since the start. Most unlike a long-distance race in the way it started, the first three or four laps and the attrition rate early on, the people coming into the pits, very, very aggressive starts from almost everybody in the race. And that's really continued, that theme has continued whether it's just the fact that they're on streets rather than a circuit that's causing that but it seems that all the drivers have got so psyched up well, I think that they're the whole, racing the whole weekend of this this is sport 500 weekend is uh, been unpredictable there has been nothing that's been normal practice has been late uh, times have been wrong every single thing's happened here that you could ever imagine to happen you couldn't uh, choreography this it's been a just absolutely exciting two days 
Nate of Brock is taking such a leisurely approach to this race at this point that he drives down the pit straight with his arm resting on the door. It just seems to be like a Sunday afternoon drive for Peter Brock, but uh, he, he knows that the realistically there's only one man between he and the lead, and we know that HDT do, do good pit stops, so uh, everything looking good for the general's man in this race. Okay, let's go down to the pits if we can and have a word with Peter Brock's co-driver, Larry Perkins, who's down with Graham Booth. like we've got a little hold up down on the pits we'll get to that in just a moment peter brock circulating beautifully starting to live up to his name of peter perfect you have a look at the lines he takes have a look at the gap between the car and the curbs it's the perfect line every time so smooth so like, good to watch peter brock i'd like to bring another aspect into this race at the moment that uh, if you look around the circuit, the rubber is starting to get laid and the cars are not getting so sideways because initially the circuit was very abrasive with no rubber that we see on the normal circuits and now the circuit's getting rubber all over it and I think it's helping the drivers be more consistent and uh, the lap time could improve as the rubber gets laid later on in the day. We have a lap time for Wayne Wilkinson here, 134.7. It's not a bad sort of pace when you look at the qualifying times. Everybody's going fairly quickly. It's, it's, I don't think anyone's treated it as a 500-kilometer race. I think it's a sprint. Okay, as we said before, let's have a word to Peter Brock's co-driver, Larry Perkins, who's down in the pits with Graham Booth. Well, Larry, you must be pretty wrapped with the way Peter's going out there. Well, yeah, obviously uh, cautiously pleased. Um, the driving, uh, hopefully, within the limits of the car. And, uh, Normal attrition rates uh, are being kind to us. We've gone from fifth up to second. We're three seconds behind the uh, BMW. We make the uh, Bajan BMW third, quite a distance behind us. And uh, fourth is the uh, uh, Triton BMW. When are you going to be getting into the car? Well, we're scheduling to come in on lap 77 to 80. We'll just play it by ear with traffic in the pits and then how the times are going. And what would it be then? A complete change of tyres? Yes. Fuel, anything else? We'll put uh, four new tyres on and uh, fill it up with gas and then we'll go through to the finish. All being well. Is the race running basically to the way you planned it? Oh, very much so. Uh, we always plan where we can run reliably. Uh, that is hopefully. And, it, and, and uh, we had a very bad practice through mechanical uh, problems and we did fix it at this point in time. And uh, there is no reason why it shouldn't keep going at this. You certainly worked hard overnight to get rid of those mechanical problems. Well, yes, we had to. Well, it looks like it's going to pay off today. Well, no, it's far too early to say that. We've now done 51 laps of 150 that race, and there is no way that I'll ever walk around smiling until that 150 laps has happened, because anything can happen in racing, and uh, what we require is not any good luck, but it's not any bad luck. Larry Perkins is talking to Graham Booth down in the pits. Obviously a very happy man, and the mark of the professionalism of the whole dealer team is that they say not about 75 laps will come in, but we will come in on lap 77. They've worked out 75 laps at the halfway point, of course, but 77 laps is enough to give them a safe margin past the halfway mark. They know what they can do on a tank of gas, so they come in at lap 77. Let's go back at this stage and have a look at the highlights of the last hour or so of the Nissan Sport 500 race. Almost appearing to fall to pit, and the bonnet flapping at one end and the rear bumper flapping at the other. And he, he's only, as we say, now 29 laps into the event. In the pits, we have the Volvo that was leading the race, Michel Delcours, and also in the pits, Tom Walkinshaw. We'll find out what the problem was with Tom Walkinshaw's car from the crew very shortly. We know the problem with the Volvo was the bonnet catch on one side had come up and the bonnet was flapping in the air. Tom Three Walkinshaw. Cars. Tom Walkinshaw has stopped. Obviously, whatever the problem was, it has got worse. He thought he could keep circulating instead of coming into the pits. He's given his crew a wave each time around. 
And there he is, stationary. Russell of them walking back to the pits from the rover. In fact, Kyle Walkershaw must have handed over to him to give him a drive. And uh, the lonely walk back from Australian driver Ron Dixon. Well, Frank Bitter now has a real problem with that bumper. It is a safety hazard now. And the organizers probably will be looking very seriously at that because if that came off in front of a following car, it could be very dangerous indeed. Now, it's going to work its way backwards and forwards and uh, eventually break, but uh, hopefully soon so that it doesn't cause the men with the black flag to come running out. That we expected when the overseas drivers came here with their expensive machinery and team that the two locals might get blitzed. Well, it's not happening, and the two locals are doing what they know best, having a good tussle on the circuit. And uh, it looks like the Neil Lowe car is, is uh, a bit quicker than the Wilkerson car, and uh, it's just a matter of a few laps before he gets past the head of Wilkerson. In fact, a brilliant braking manoeuvre, and he nearly got right past him there. Oh. Welcome back live, and the news of the moment is that Wayne Wilkinson has had a little off. Well, how camp it, that was what happened. Went into the containers there, which don't have a lot of give, and you can see the panel damage on the front of the beautiful black BM coming into the pits now to see if they can repair that. They're going to have a, a job on their hands. There'll be some very fast panel beating here. It's amazing sometimes how quickly they can straighten the panels on these cars when they come into the pits. It's a bit rough and ready, the method of panel beating, but it does to get you back in the race. They're topping up with gas meantime anyway. And have we had a driver change? Well, that means that uh, it's going to be sitting at Brock and Low. Let's try to check if we had a change of driver there, if Neville Crichton has got into the car. It's Wayne Wilkinson. Well, I've obviously had no suspension damage. Just checked to make sure there was no problems and uh, probably put a bit of tape on it and sent it on out without losing too much time. So this is his second unscheduled pit stop and Wayne Wilkinson would have given himself a bit of a fright going to those containers and uh, taken a while to get his lap times back, which allows Peter Brock and Larry Perkins to, to get further away from the man, Frank Sittner, as well. We'll give you a very unofficial place things as we see it at the present time and we believe Frank Sittner to be leading from Peter Brock Neil Lowe in third place with the pit arrival of uh, Neville Crichton now Gary Patterson and Paul Adams should be fourth and fifth the only variation on that would be that Michelle Delcour who we know had a fairly lengthy pit stop and the way that Volvo is rocketing he could well have caught back to disadvantage and put himself back up and say fifth or fourth or fifth spot Michelle Delker circulating, uh, using all the circuit, not doing anything wrong. We just heard from the pits that the damage to the BMW was very superficial. It hasn't damaged any suspension. It's just panel damage, so that's good news for them. Well, Wayne Wilkinson will be happy about that because he's a co-driver in the team. And the one thing you don't want to do is to damage a car and put it out when it's not yours. And he'll be very pleased that the car's able to circulate in as quick as it was before, I'm sure. I'm very disappointed, Wayne Wilkinson, though, from even sort of damaging such a beautiful BMW 65 CSI as that. Very, very lucky indeed not to damage suspension components or anything that would upset the handling. It's not a fast enough circuit for that to make any difference in aerodynamics. Just a little shunt and a moment of brain fade. While we're just uh, watching the BMW of uh, Wayne Wilkinson go around the circuit, of the three BMWs on the circuit, this is the only one on Dunlop tyres. Virtually the whole field is on Dunlop tyres. But the other two BMWs of Sittner and Ken Bajan. Wayne Wilkinson still on good lap times. And we imagine will have settled down to a more consistent form of driving now as we would expect all of the drivers to have done such a furious pace at the start of this race and the first uh, half hour or so really far faster than perhaps it should have been 
for the cars to last the distance. Here's a good battle between Gary Pedersen and uh, Paul Adams just in front of him. Yes, it is. Paul Adams in front of Gary Pedersen. Paul Adams in the 1600s class and Gary Pedersen in the two and a half litre class. And these two have been close the whole race, Tony. Gary Pedersen at one stage dropped back a bit further than this, but uh, he appears to have closed in a bit on Paul Adams as the race has gone on. Maybe his tyres are working better on the front wheel drive Fiat. Well, we make, we make this the battle between fifth and sixth place. Paul Adams leading Gary Pedersen. And when you look at those cars on the circuit, it appears that Paul Adams is able to keep Gary Pedersen out. And that's a phenomenal performance for a little 1600 for dollar, admittedly a twin cam version. But Gary Pedersen's Fiat 130 is a two litre twin cam in Group A form with quite some modifications. Yes, talking about uh, Japanese cars and their Group A cars, Paul Adams' Group A Toyota GT was a specially homologated built car, and it, for a 1600 car, it goes very, very quickly. And I would expect the bigger cars to go even better later on. But Paul Adams is a rear-wheel drive car, Gary Patterson and the Fiat is front-wheel drive, and I think the front-wheel drive coming out of the hairpins is causing a lot of understeer, and that's where Paul seems to pull away. But Gary seems to have more power on the straight from a bigger engine to close in, but out of these tight hairpins, the front-wheel drive of the Fiat isn't quite as good as the rear-wheel drive of the Toyota. And between these two cars, they have four of New Zealand's best-known names in motor racing. Paul Adams, of course, driving with his father-in-law, John Wolf, uh, Alan Wolf, shall I say, and Gary Pedersen driving with uh, Dave McMillan. Well, it's a tremendous kind of experience we've got here because Gary Pedersen has been a single-seater driver, a saloon car driver, and a sports car driver. Gary, Dave McMillan has been a saloon car driver in long-distance events and a specialist in Formula Ford and Formula Pacific racing. Paul Adams is a rally driver and a long-distance racer, and Alan Wolf is a long-distance driver, a rally driver, and a, uh, he's been a short-race sprint modified saloon driver. So the experience that you have on these four drivers is, uh, covers virtually every form of motorsport and motor racing we've ever had in this country. Well, we have another one of those pit board readings, very unofficial, of course. Michelle Delcourt is holding out third place to the Volvo driver. Uh, so that's giving us a position of Cinta, Brock, Delcourt, Adams and Pedersen. But we, the complication now will be Neville Crichton, how much time did he lose, or Wayne Wilkinson, how much time did he lose in that pit stop to fuel, straighten a bit of panel damage. But he'll probably work his way back up the field into uh, fourth or fifth spot. Down in the pits at the moment, we have Frank Sittner's co-driver, John Morton from Auckland with Graham Booth. Well, John, you were telling me a few minutes ago that you feel almost physically sick as you watch Frank out front there. The tension's getting so great. Well, that's normal for me. I don't know whether it's normal for anyone else. But, yeah, that's what I'm feeling like. Yeah. What'll it be like once you get into the car? You're obviously looking forward to that. Oh, that's no problem. Like, that's, that's what I'm here for. Just waiting. The unknown. I hate it. When do you think you'll be doing the change? About half. About halfway. About two hours. We want to go a little over the halfway so that we know our fuel's all right. Yeah, have you got any lap mapped out in particular? Any, sorry, what? Any lap in particular you're going to do no, that? Not, no, it's whatever, well, it's 150 laps, so, you know, half of that. Yeah, you mathematician? <laughs> not at all. Have you had much of a chance to drive in this particular car? Well, I had the last untimed session yesterday. I had a few, a few laps in the morning, and the last untimed session with old tyres and full tanks. So it gave me a feel of the car, but... Um, I'm not used to driving on the left-hand side. It's a bit like thinking in one language and talking in another, but I'm sure I'll get the hang of it. So you're looking forward to getting out there and wearing the job? That's what I'm looking forward to, yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's quite a, quite a pertinent point that uh, John Morton has brought up there, getting having grown up driving right-hand drive cars and getting into a BMW with left-hand drive. Yes, I'd like to say, Tony, at this stage, that that's why I picked Perkins and Brock to probably win the race because they've got two drivers in a right-hand drive car and they both know the car and they're both their normal co-drivers. But John Morton has never driven a uh, left-hand drive car before and I remember when I first hooked him in a 5 and a 5,000 
uh, the gear lever was on the right-hand side, but that didn't matter. But when I hopped in a left-hand drive rally car of Timo Salonen's, I was completely disorientated and I was extremely slow. And I think it would be very difficult for John Morton to learn how to drive as quick as Frank Sittner did. So I think that the Brock Perkins car is looking very, very good because it's a right-hand drive car. One thing we'll try and do uh, in the next few moments is try and get a word with Robbie Francovic, who, of course, is driving with Michelle Delcour in the Volvo, which has been the real surprise of this race. Uh, rear, apart from the bonnet flapping as it still is in front, it has been an amazing car. And uh, Michelle Delcour really showed his class early on in this race, driving through the field, having to start on the back of the grid because he wasn't an official time practice. Uh, we knew it was quick, but we didn't really know it was this quick. Uh, we think that they uh, might be coming in shortly into the pits. We're going to try and get a word with Robbie Francimic anyway. From Michelle, then, Michelle Delcourt must be looking good for winning the Pukakai race next weekend because this is the first of the less than two Sport 500 races, the one being around the Wellington streets, and here we have the Volvo coming into the pits. Uh, they'll hopefully fix the bonnet. They may take on tyres and fuel, and maybe Robbie Finese, which will take over on the driving side. But here it is in the pits. It'll be interesting to see what they do. Yeah, they're panicking. They're ready. They're fuel. It'll be interesting to see where they take time and change tyres, Tony. Ah, now they've got the right piece. They've got the stud to screw in there instead of the piece of wire. And a fire extinguisher to cool the uh, radiator down this time instead of all the water steaming up in front of them. Good thinking. Peter, we have a, a gap of five seconds between Frank Sittner in the lead and Peter Brock in second place. So there's your race order at the moment. One, two, Peter Brock second, Frank Sittner, the BMW first. This man was in third spot and, and carving them up. You would have noticed that he passed Peter Brock, even though he was at that stage at least a lap down. But now back in the pits and losing more time, he's just giving himself something of a handicap race. There's no driver change here, Tony. Michelle Delcourt is still in the car. And very good to see that it's uh, ancillary bits and pieces that are costing them the time rather than a major engine problem. So the car is still in there and the gamble is still on. They know how quickly it can go. They can make up the time. Well, it's certainly, if it doesn't win this weekend, I'm going to be at Pukake watching to see what happens next weekend. That certainly has been Volvo's name in recent years, as uh, Michel Delcour puts it, security. That's the security for the driver, safety aspect is what they've been known for, certainly not until recently as race cars. But obviously they've got this 240 Volvo Turbo going extremely well, and in a couple of races in Europe, it's been up there with the Jaguars and the Rovers. Yeah, see Michel Delcour there's actually run into something. Uh, these tyres on the right front there, you can see bits, the parts hanging off the car, so he's another one of, that's had problems with tyres. Let's go down and have a talk to Michel Delcour's co-driver, New Zealander Robbie Francovic. Well, Robbie, you've had your share of problems with the Volvo this afternoon. Let's hear some of them. It probably doesn't seem... It probably looks worse than it is because we've got a fuel, full tank of fuel and our tyres are good. Michel has lost his drive for Volvo in Europe. And he, knowing this event as a very big event in Europe, is showing everybody that he is a first-class driver. And although it looks bad now, things could change because we've only got one more scheduled stop and then I will drive to the finish. So there's a lot to happen yet. You've had a few hassles with the bonnet coming up, I've seen Robbie. Do you think you're in now? Yes, we've put new pins in now and locked them down securely. What about Pukakoe next week? You're saying, you know, you've had the huge hassle this afternoon of having to bring the car down, fly it all the way, no time for preparation. You reckon that Pukakoe, watch out, last time I spoke to you. Well, at Pukakoe, we'll have our Generation 2 engine, which has got an extra 20 horsepower. So if it looks like it's going quick today, it'll be brilliant next week. Well, Rob, Robbie Francovic, always an optimist, but that's good news if they've got an engine that's got 20 horsepower more than this one. Well, what a phenomenally fast car that just does not look fast. It, it's the second most powerful car in the race. Dick Johnson's car had a reputed 350 to maybe 380 brake horsepower, but this Volvo turbo car has quoted at 320 to 340 brake horsepower, and that's why he was able to, uh, so to speak, carve up the 
BMWs and Peter Brock and the Commodore early on in the race because it is the second most powerful car in the race. So Peter Brock with the job in front of him now. Peter Brock really was always the dark horse. Nobody was quite sure how quickly he was able to go because they had so little practice. But nobody ever doubted that they would be consistent. There's the race leader, Frank Sidner. Looking back for Peter Brock now. That's Peter Brock. And I guess the real quality that Peter, Peter Brock and Larry Perkins will bring to this race is that they're not going to panic if they're not in the lead in the first couple of laps. They're quite happy to sit there. While they're accustomed to Bathurst to leading start to finish, they know that you don't have to to win a, a, a long distance race like this. Well, I don't want to be pessimistic here for GM fans, but there was a funny look being transmitted from Peter Brock to his pit man at that time, and the lap that they did was 137.1. Now, that's at least three seconds slower than he's been doing. Now, that may be an ominous sign. The car hasn't sounded sharp for the last couple of laps. we we'll just watch the board. 136 going up, so holding space, holding time, but uh, not quite as quick as we might have expected Peter Brock to be going. But certainly not on the pace he was capable of earlier in the race and not the kind of pace we'd expect Peter Brock to do consistently. Well, Frank Sidner said he wouldn't get involved in a race. Uh, he did charge fairly hard for a kickoff, but I've noticed that he's been slowing down a bit and he's actually pulling away from Peter Brock. So, uh, as you say, David and Tony, there may be some small problem with uh, Peter Brock's car. Well, we have got through the miracles of science, another computer in operation, and we understand that we will have, every 20 minutes or so, an update from a second computer, which is all plugged in and ready to go. So, we'll bring you that as it comes to hand. Here we are, Peter Brock, coming up to the infamous bridge complex, which hasn't at this stage caused any trouble. Peter Brock getting across the bridge with no problems. Peter Brock is waving to his pits, but I don't think it's uh, I don't think he's got too much of a problem because he's closing in on Frank Sidner again. Peter Brock that time with the thumbs up signal. Yes. Seems whatever the problem was on the last lap, he has yes. and either he's found or uh, he's happy. He's closing right in on Frank Sidner too. Here comes Frank Sidner with Peter Brock right on his tail. Now, a couple of laps ago, that was quite a gap. Now it looks as though Peter Brock might just step it up a little. Frank Sidner's car is sounding a bit rough there and doesn't appear to be coming out of the hairpins too good. He might have a gearbox problem. Because uh, Peter Brock closes right up out of the tight corners so and Frank Sidner might have lost first gear. Well, just to confuse us a little bit further now, Brock team are holding out P3, which is obviously third place to the Peter Brock team. So uh, one thing we are sure of, this man, Frank Sittner, is uh, leading the race, but he's got Peter Brock at least trying to pass him for whatever place that is. Out of these tight corners, Tony, the gap closes right up, so I think Frank Sittner's definitely got a problem. Turning into the infamous bridge complex, which caused uh, an accident for the minis yesterday and a bit of a bridge block. Peter Brock getting close. The Brock's team are definitely holding out P3. Yes, Third well, place. certainly the teams can... Uh, do their own lap scoring and occasionally get a bit uh, optimistic about their own places so uh, it's not ever fair to trust them but an organization as good as peter brock and larry perkins eight times winners of bathurst really know what they're doing what we know though is that neil lowe is flying through the field he is the most consistent of the kiwis although he had a pit stop he hasn't hit any containers he doesn't appear to be having any problems and Look for him in the top three places. I would uh, put, if, if this is true, I'd actually put Neil Lowe in the lead with Frank Sinner second, Peter Brock third, because Neil Lowe passed these two competitors while we are off here before. An interesting point about Neil Lowe driving the car is that a lot has been said here about the physical effort of driving around this circuit. 
and uh, Neil Lowe, we know from B and H in the slow races, is very, very clever when it comes to that. This is Wayne Wilkinson into the pits again. Well, very, very slowly. Yes, obviously something wrong with the car that they didn't see. They said it was superficial damage, but there's something else wrong with it. And it's probably a mechanical problem too, because uh, he's going so slowly into the pits. Well, it doesn't seem like he's interested in getting out again at all. No, I'm just wondering whether or not he's lost first gear or something. I think that's a major, the way he's coming into the pits. Yeah, if, he, if he was going to go out again, he'd be rushing in there. No effort at all. Well, uh, there's a pit manager, Ray Stone, about to talk to Wayne Wilkinson. Find out what that problem is. He's definitely lost his driver, some sort. They're pushing the car down to the pits. I don't think we're going to see them back in the rest of the race. Well, that's very obviously a problem, and the way they approach the pits, I don't think we're going to see him out again for a little while. Well, so here's Neil Lowe. Possibly our race leader, traveling very quickly, passing everybody on the road. From three sources now, we have the leader being Neil Lowe from Frank Sittner and Peter Brock. So uh, this is the man who, by consensus, seems to be leading the event. And as I said, by the, by the time uh, the second computer is uh, fully spitting out its details, we'll be able to confirm that for you officially. It's a marvellous fight back from being a minute 45 down for this, that unscheduled pit stop to come back into the lead. It's uh, Neil Lowe proved how quick he was in the Benson Hedges race and he's doing it here again today. Have a lap time for Frank Sittner in the number 6 BMW, 138. So the pace is dropping quite measurably. A time also for Peter Brock, 138.6. So now we're seeing the effect of this endurance race on the lap time. The well, guys are slowing down. Realistically, it had to slow down, didn't it? Okay, we just heard from the pits that the problem with the BMW in front of you there, Wayne Wilkinson and Neville Crichton's car, it's lost all the gears. And that could be part of the problem with um, Frank Sittner having lost maybe first gear and why he is coming so slowly out of the hairpin corners. So we might see a very fast gearbox change here. Is that likely to be selectors or the gearbox itself? Well, the BMWs are supposed to have a very reliable gearbox, so I would think it's probably a, a selector problem rather than a gear braking problem, Tony. The result is that they can't select any gear, and the way they were coming into the pit so very slowly just coasting along there, it was obvious they had no drive. We'll try and get a word with them if we can. They're refueling the car and they're changing the tyres, so, and uh, it doesn't look like they're changing a gearbox, so maybe it was just a gear lever problem. Well, they're underneath the car, they'll be checking it all out, but that's very bad luck for Wayne Wilkinson and Neville Crichton. Knowing the professionalism of this team, they will have it out just as quickly as it can be fixed, but that might cost them too much. Crying shame for that BMW. We still have two left in the race in first and second place. Neil Lowe leading from Frank Sittner. Peter Brock in third place. Michelle Delcour coming up in fourth place and really improving that as the, as the race goes on. So Frank Sittner on 65. Neil Lowe on 65 laps. Peter Brock on 64. Michelle Delcour on 64. And then go back to Paul Adams on 62. And Paul well, Adams still ahead of Gary Pedersen. Kent Bajan, who is the car or organizes this team that Neil Lowe's driving, would be absolutely ecstatic now. They've won the last four races in a row, and here they are leading the fifth on a trot. So it's a tremendous performance from this team to be leading some of the world's best Group A drivers and some very good teams that are in this, that are in this race here today. All this is good news, of course, for the Kiwi entrants who mightn't be in BMWs or uh, Holdens or or should we say Group A holds, but the, the midfield, the people that pack out the field will be racing for some fantastic prize money. Just running through that, $20,000 to win this race, $11,000 for second, $6,000 for third, $3,000 for fourth, and $2,500 for fifth place. Fantastic prize money, and also, as we've said earlier, classes, $2,000 for North to 1600 class, and $1,000 for the 1600 25 class. So 
good money for the locals in the offing. Well, I think Paul Adams is going to be in some money either way, isn't he? Well, of course, he inherits the uh, the overall place money if he finishes high up, and there he is on your screen now. Now, he is leading the Norton 1600 class quite easily. In fact, he's actually leading the, the Norton 2, or should we say the 1600 2 5 class leader, uh, who would probably be one of the alphas. Gary Pedersen, in fact, leading that two and a half litre class, and Paul Adams in front of him. So for Paul Adams to be in front of his own class as well as the two and a half litre class, I know we've said it before, but that's an amazing performance and superb driving from a fellow that we know is very, very clever on streets. On your screen now is the Belvin Brothers uh, Commodore. That was the one formerly driven by Neville Crichton and Wayne Wilkinson, but this battle behind them. Paul Adams and Gary Pedersen has gone on for the whole race, just over an hour and 40 minutes now. And those guys have been fighting it out in spite of all these Volvos around them and BMWs. They've stayed nose to tail and having a terrific dice. Hello, the Volvo, the Fiat got a bit close to the Holden of the Belvin brothers, dispensed with that fairly quickly and uh, continued their battle. Okay, let's go down to the pits and get a word with Wayne Wilkinson, the Wilkinson Crichton team. Wayne Wilkinson has just come in and they've lost the gears. We've seen the BMW come in, now we've seen it go out. We understand you had a loss of uh, all drive to it. Yeah, well, it had broken a uh, drive valve, and, uh, you know, we just had to replace one. You must be pretty relieved to see it go out again. Well, yeah, I think we haven't got much of a show here now. We had a few problems. Uh, I got pushed that into the curb once, and... Uh... OK, we have a problem there with the microphone down on the pits. There is so much noise, and one of the other problems, of course, is the unsuppressed spark plug leads in these cars, which tend to interfere sometimes with our equipment. The gist of the message from Wayne Wilkinson was that the gearbox is gone, they can replace it, and they can get back out. Peter Brock has got in front of Frank Sittner. Yes, he just noticed that uh, Frank Sittner, I think you might find, has a gearbox problem as well, Tony. He does not get out of these tight corners too well, although uh, maybe it was some other problem around the back of the circuit when we weren't looking that he might have had a spin. All of this bodes very well for the Group A Commodore in its very initial stages of development. The BMWs, of course, have been around for a year or two and developed very, very well in Europe and in England by a number of different people. Peter Brock is the man who normally is responsible for the development of Commodores or Holdens in general and for selling the competition parts. So this bodes well for the VK. We've just heard that the Wilkinson BMW uh, broke a half shaft is being replaced. In fact, uh, in after practice yesterday, I saw them changing those for some new ones. So maybe they have a problem there. And it's a rough road circuit that's causing these problems, Tony. Yes, they have half shafts like Formula Pacifics with uh, two CV joints, one on either end. And what they were doing was changing from the covered ones with a normal rubber boot on them to the finned ones, which cool better. Yes, obviously uh, some problem here. They knew they had a problem before they started the race, and that's why they changed them. Being a street race and more bumps and tighter corners, uh, maybe that's a problem. Well, Peter Brock still driving very, very nice lines. Very smooth. A race time for Neil Lowe, 1 minute 35 seconds. And that is at a race time distance of 1 hour 47 minutes. So we're just approaching the halfway point. Uh, another 15 minutes or so to go before halfway and that is then when we would expect to have a pit stop in line for Peter Brock remembering he told us 70 laps or so he was 77 laps or so he would be stopping so we have it now 70 laps down 80 laps to go and Michelle Del Port in the pits and the Volvo with the bonnet up yet again Notice these uh, overseas mechanics and Michelle Dell's tours team are very, very quick at getting the bottom up and checking underneath. Uh, that's oil going in there. Yeah, it seems to be uh, consuming a little oil. Yes, well, it's not uncommon for a turbo to use some, but perhaps a little too much in that case. Yeah, I think they've obviously lost some water on that first pit stop, and the car'd be overheating, and that would be help wouldn't be helping the uh, oil usage. It's probably a bit excessive. Uh, it's putting some of our famous thousand mile tape on the car there to keep it all together so that the stewards don't complain and the car get black flagged. 
That was the damage that uh, brought about a rear end collision with uh, Neville Crichton earlier on. Sorry, Wayne Wilkinson earlier on in the JPS Black BMW. Also, there's some damage on the back of this car as well. The Michelle's had in, in, in a race full of incidents, pit stops and contact with other cars. That's a pretty quick pit stop and back out. Well, they're dropping further down the field every time with these pit stops, Tony. That's their third one now. So I'd rate their chances of winning the race and being a force with it at the end of four hours a bit remote now. Well, with all these pit stops, uh, pit work and uh, overhaul seemingly going on in record time, we would probably be looking for Paul Adams up in as high as third place. Now, that, of course, may get overridden very quickly as soon as one of the faster cars, which has been in the pits, rejoins the race and goes very quickly. Now, we understand Frank Sittner is going to make a pit stop but we'll have to follow that. But here's our race leader anyway. Neil Lowe, Neil Lowe in the low vagent Palace BMW. No damage on that car. They've done very well to keep it off the obstacles of the circuit, the parking meters and the telegraph poles and the gates, the tires and the bridge. And it's just staying where it should do on the black tar seal, neatly through the, through the bridge, not getting too close to those dirty, big wooden barriers. So running through the order of the cars, we'll go right through for you. The Bajan BMW in first place with Neil Lowe in it. Frank Sinter in second place. Peter Brock has overtaken that car, so he takes second place now. Sinter in third. Del Cour still registering fourth, but he's down a little after the pit stop. Paul Adams in fifth place. Gary Pedersen in sixth place. Kevin Ryan in seventh. The Crichton Wilkinson BMW down in eighth place now. Ray Gulson and the Alpha in ninth place. Steve Willey in tenth place. Chris Heyer in eleventh. Bob Holden in twelfth. Glenn McIntyre in thirteenth. McGregor's via the BW Golf in fourteenth place. Ray Belden in fifteenth place. The Holden of the McKinnon in sixteenth place. In seventeenth is the Mitsubishi of the McDonald's. 18th place is Bob Barry in the Fiat. In 19th, Tom Walkinshaw in the Rover still registers, but obviously he's out of the race and out of contention. And Dick Johnson registering in 20th place. The BMW of Frank Sittner appears to be circulating all right, so uh, when Peter Brock got ahead of him, I think it was probably a spin as opposed to something being wrong with the car. But Sittner seems to be circulating perfectly okay at the moment. And this uh, pit stop that we said that was coming up um, just maybe a little way off. There's Frank Sittner. He's not a very big man, this Englishman, but it's been a marvellous drive of his so far to, to lead the race like he did and keep out of all the trouble. Be interested to see if Frank Sittler pits, as uh, we've been told. But uh, I think somewhere along the line a while ago, for a few laps, he wasn't circulating properly, and he was probably signalling the pits that he might come in. But whatever the problem was, it appears to have cleared itself, and uh, he may not go into the pits. We'll just have to wait and see as he comes over the infamous bridge. This bridge is definitely holding up some of the fast cars when they get behind the slower ones, but we haven't seen any accidents there like uh, we reported, like we thought we might have. Frank Sittler in the car picture at the moment known as fearless Frank Sidner actually started motor racing with a very famous name in Formula One motor racing Frank Williams the two of them started together way back in the 60s in an Austin A40 then Frank Sidner went to Formula Ford where he gained the, the nickname of fearless Frank he's driven works Jaguar E-type he's driven all sorts of cars a long history in driving of all different kinds more recently far better known in saloon car driving. He and his brother are the largest distributors in the United Kingdom of uh, BMWs and also the sole concessionaires for Alpina cars and conversions. So they have at their fingertips a lot of expertise, a lot of machinery, a lot of parts. Have to also say about Frank Sittner who's talking about his English Group A motor racing for which he came second in the English Championship. The cost of doing Group A motor racing in England in an under 3.5 litre BMW 
just the running costs alone are 120,000 pounds, and that doesn't include the cost of the cars. Very expensive motor racing in England. And behind the black Holt Commodore is car 72, the Pinto Toyota Sprinter. Now this car, driven by Bob Holden from Australia and Glenn Clark from Papakura, they are lucky to be in the race. They massively blew their engines to pieces yesterday in practice, and only by a superhuman effort to get an engine out of a car in Auckland, and an engine owned by Mort Co Engineering up there, they actually got a Force 10 mob to bring it down and install it in the race overnight. Now this, this is the sort of great effort that's making this race one, of the, one out of the bag. The effort that each individual team has put into making sure that they get into the race, and he's in fact holding place 12 in the Nissan Sport 500. Quite interesting there, watching Bob Holden giving a little signal to Peter Brock. The two of them, of course, have raced together for years and years. In fact, Bob Holden has had 19 starts at Bathurst and 17 finishes. He has won Bathurst way back in years gone by, in a Lotus 14 I think, but an amazing history of racing. Yes, of course. And uh, a little like Alan Wolfe in New Zealand, if you like. Yes, he came over here in 1972 and did a heatwave rally when it went round the north and the south islands together. So Bob Holden has been here before, and he remembers that rally, which would probably uh, is a very expensive exercise. These cars, I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of. The little Corolla Sprinter GT. An excellent little motor, Rich. It is, especially it's a new engine that Toyota have developed for their Group A cars. And um, I, as you say, Tony, we'll see more of them in the future, but this is a new, exciting engine. Behind Neil Lowe in the BMW. And Peter Brock just circulating around at consistent lap times, doing it fairly easily at this stage, not trying to race anybody, just running his own race with his professional team and co-driver Larry Perkins will know that he can go out there. The two of them know they can do the same lap times, lap after lap, being held up just a little. And uh, Peter Brock yeah. giving that uh, adversary heaps with his fists there. We don't think he was waving at it to be friendly, but uh, Peter Brock has another use for that arm. He uses a Bathurst to cup air, as he says. Is he but, just uh, Peter Brock, 30 seconds behind leader Neil Slow at this point. 30 seconds behind at approximately two hours race distance. And we're looking for a stop by Peter Brock in about three or four laps. He's waving again. He's uh, very good at his hand signals, Peter. No one usually knows what they mean, but uh, he's always very demonstrative, and uh, he's enjoying this race. Second place is not where he's going to be. He's going to aim for the lead, and we'll probably see some change in order after the pit stop. Amazing that Peter Brock has got the ability to drive a car and tell people off at the same time. He does it very well. We're at the halfway point of the race now, 75 of the 150 laps completed. Neil Lowe with 30 seconds advantage over Peter Brock. And Frank Sittner in third place. So first is a BMW, second is the VK Commodore, and third, the other BMW still running, that of Frank Sittner. And before we go any further at this halfway point, let's have a look at some of the highlights of the last hour or so. But, uh, we've still got a terrific race on because the fans, this is what they wanted to see. Their man, Peter Brock, making a, an attempt to break the dominance of BMWs in Group A type racing. Peter Brock is taking such a leisurely approach to this race at this point. You can see the panel damage on the front of the beautiful black BM coming into the pits now to see if they can repair that. They're going to have a, a job on their hands. There'll be some very fast panel beating here. It's amazing sometimes how quickly they can straighten the panels on these cars when they come into the pits. It's a bit rough and ready, the method of panel beating, but it does to get you back in the race. Paul Adams leading Gary Pedersen. And when you look at those cars on the circuit, it appears that Paul Adams is able to keep Gary Pedersen out. W officially in the lead of the race. Let's have a look at it again. It just went all wrong for him. Just losing the tail, sliding it round. He's damaged a rim. He's going to have to pit. He'll be lucky if that's all his damage. Uh, if it is just a rim, it's simply a question of changing the tyres. So Peter Brock takes over the lead. But uh, I would imagine having hit the kerb that hard with a rim like that, they'll be lucky if they haven't damaged the drive shaft as well. Well, we know, of course, those half shafts are suspect or suspect area anyway, and to give them a whack like that, Tony, as you say, 
but uh, Neil's pressing on regardless. The wheel, the uh, BBS driver, is beaten very seriously. He's indicating he's going in, of course, which we not know. He's, he's let someone through on the bridge. Very gentlemanly manoeuvre there by Neil Lowe. But uh, he's lost a fair amount of time already, and now, fortunately for him, he's about at a scheduled stop anyway. So it'll be a wheel change, petrol on board, quick examination to uh, make sure that there's no immediate worry and then hopefully go out and see what, what the effect is. That might be the first indication we've seen of drivers getting tired. Yes, uh, although in that car they have got power steering, so it should have actually helped them a little bit, but um, I'm sure they'll have a half shaft problem here. If Wilkinson's car has already had one, then um, this has probably affected theirs as well. Well, we do know that to uh, all you GM fans and Peter Brock fans, Peter Brock, leader of the Nissan Sport 500 at just over two hours and look for him to make his pit stop shortly. We've had Frank Sinter sitting there back in the pit, or in the pit should I say, so that's now the pit activity is starting. Yeah, that's Frank Sinter's scheduled pit stop, I think, for petrol, the halfway stage. Now we have Neil Lowe in your screen, handing over the pit pages, leaving the pit very quickly, change the wheel, so obviously they're not expecting much damage. Uh, the race is going to be between the man in your screen, Peter Brock, and now Ken Mason going out to make up that deficit, which uh, unfortunately Neil Lowe incurred through mounting the curve. Ken Bajan's pit stop was only 37 seconds, so it was very, very quick. So the only time they've lost that was um, Neil Lowe coming back into the pits when he was going slowly. Frank Sittner in the pit, he had his schedule stop and away sharply. That'll be John Lawson now at the wheel of the Metro Johnson BMW. Handing over, uh, handed over to, uh, sorry, Frank Sittner handed over to John Lawson. So Frank will be quite tired. He's had two hours at the wheel, some of it leading. And uh, now John Lawson increasing his familiarization of this circuit, remembering he has not done many laps. Let's uh, see in the next few moments if we can't get a word with uh, fearless Frank Sittner as John Morton gets to grips with this track. It'll take him a lap or two, perhaps even five laps, before he's back onto the right kind of pace consistently, lap after lap at the same lap time, which is what he's got to do to stay in the race. John Morton will have to curb any inclination that he might have mentally to go out there and go really fast. He's going to have to sit on consistent lap time. He will know that, but actually doing it is a little more difficult. Yeah, Frank Sittner would have said to you, John, the circuit's getting greasy. Um, he would have seen the fact that low has gone off. We've seen the cars oversteering, so maybe there's been some oil dropped on the circuit. And he'd say, just go out there and finish, and we can probably win this race. Because you wouldn't be telling a, a new driver to get out there and win because the chances of having an accident would be very great. So I'm sure he's had a big message to just finish. Remembering that the BMW in your picture has Pirelli tyres on, and we understand that to be a harder compound than the Dunlop, so they're going to take four or five laps to get up to temperature, and possibly that's what John's noticing, that the car is quite tail-happy. It actually got very close to the kerb, which claimed Neil Lowe's right rear wheel. It's going to be intriguing now to see what time Peter Brock can do for a pit stop, because Neil Lowe's at 37 seconds was very efficient, very quick. Nothing went wrong, and it's all fine. Peter Brock's team is very experienced. They don't have center locking wheel nuts. They've got to undo five of them on each wheel, admittedly with an air gun, but it takes a little longer, and it remains to be seen. Coming in now, Peter. Peter Brock. This is vital. This really counts. How long it takes him in the pits. Let's just see how experienced and professional this team is. Well, he speeded into the pits very fast. I'm sure that was more than 20 kilometers an hour that you're allowed. Larry Perkins getting in the car. And make no mistake, Peter Brock and Larry Perkins could consistently keep the same lap times as we've seen at Bathurst in previous years. They are very, very close in terms of driver ability and very close in their lap times. They can do them perfectly, reel them off lap after lap. And that's what's required to win a race like this. Everything going smoothly at this point. 30 seconds, so they have to bonnet up. They're putting some uh, oil in, yes? Oil at the side of the DK engine. Neil, the engine man, pumping her up with some uh, some of the sponsors' fine product, and uh, Peter giving a few debriefing instructions to Larry. Probably and telling him now, you know what you're going to do out there. It's just like Bathurst. Go out there and win the race. Well, I noticed they're uh, not turning the engine off, which is allowed under the rules now, and uh, that won't be helping the oil going very quickly either, because there'll be a certain amount of blow-by, which will uh, make putting the oil in slow. 
Well, Peter Nikesh is just looking at Peter Brock and how tiring it is out there. I mean, there's a man, a veteran of so many long-distance races, and he is tired. Peter never, looked, never has looked like that getting out of a Bathurst car that I've seen, and two hours has certainly taken its toll on Peter Brock. I have never seen Peter Brock get out of a car and look like that. He normally gets out and combs his hair and just looks perfect. Well, that was 1 minute 20 seconds for that pit stop. A long pit stop, although we, uh, we expected him to, to be a lot quicker than that, remembering he had to add oil. So uh, he probably had an indication that the oil light might be coming on in the slow turns, and that necessitated adding some oil. Doesn't really mean he's got a problem, but he, uh, he's allowed to add oil. Probably wants to make sure that the, uh, the engine stays reliable and doesn't do any bearing damage. Notice the car's getting very wide there in that corner where it claimed near low. Maybe there's oil on it. Without uh, the car having the advantage of a dry stump, it's quite possible the oil was getting low enough on corners like this, on a circuit like this, to get some surge problems. You may have noticed it on the oil pressure gauge. Well, of course, that, in theory, should put back into the lead the Kent Bajan Neil Low car. There is some word around the pits that, in fact, Peter Brock was leading earlier than we actually said, uh, remembering that early in the race, Kent Bajan had a stop of 1 minute 45 seconds. And all during the first two hours, Peter Brock was circulating it at 1 minute 35 and really not doing anything wrong at all. So in theory, he should have been leading. But uh, now, definitely, uh, 1 minute 22 in the pits has dropped him down behind Neil Lowe. Oh, should we say Kent Bajan in the car now? Well, Ken Fajan is a good driver. He's uh, proven in previous races that he can lap consistently at the beginning of a race and at the end of a race. And this Mrs. Sport 500 race is by no means over, even after it's gone its halfway stage. Normally long distance races can get a little bit boring, but not this race. We're going to have, a, I would say, a battle between the Commodore that we see now driven by Larry Perkins and the BMW driven by Fajan. I noticed uh, Peter Brock's crew have now taken the placing off their pit board. Also, Larry Perkins taking a while to get used to the circuit there because he got passed by Neville Crichton in the BMW. Well, this is the race leader, we think, at this point, remembering, of course, that the computer is the only official recognition for places, but we're doing our own charts from this point, and we have to be on the spot to try and bring you up to date as quickly as possible. But Kent Bajan leading now, and seemingly there is no real trouble with the uh, the axle shaft, the CV joints of that right rear wheel, which is extremely lucky when you consider how hard that uh, Neil Lowe caught the curb on Gervois Key. Or well, depending on your point of view, extremely good machinery that doesn't buckle under such stress. Yes, well the car is built and homologated into Group A, and it's all, it's all strengthened where they think it is weak. Um, the car has got to be able to take a bang like that, and uh, I'm sure when they design these components of the motor car, they make sure that they're not too fragile. And this car has been reliable in the recent four races that it's won, and here it is leading another race. Uh, a bit luckily, we must admit, but uh, it's nevertheless, Ken Bajan is in the lead. We should perhaps explain the confusion over the placings at the front of this race. There are two computer systems working, one of which is the official computer system on which places are supposed to be judged. But since both of them have at some stage broken down or lost information, there was a silly situation before where Peter Brock's crew were quite convinced he was in second place and lots of other people who'd been keeping lap charts had him first. Well, in fact, uh, Mr. Bathurst himself, Ivan Sibard, is doing his, uh, his own little chart and he had Peter Brock in the lead, as, we, as Tony said, when uh, Peter had, Peter's crew had him in second place. But anyway, this does not detract, detract from the excitement. For a long distance race, we haven't had a dull lap in the whole event. And to bring you up to date with Paul Adams' position, he's firmly ahead of Gary Pedersen now. He's about five seconds ahead of Gary Pedersen, even though they aren't in the same class. We loosely refer to them as the, the baby category, or the smaller category. The interest is on the big cars. We have a uh, moment in hand with the race progressing very nicely at the middle stages now. Most of the top drivers have got through their pit stops relatively trouble-free. But at this point on the track a little earlier today, there was an incident that wasn't terribly nice. 
for Neil Lowe. Now this is where he lost the tail, came around and have a look at how hard that wheel hits the kerb. That's an enormous amount of stress to go on the half shafts and the differential and the drivetrain in general. But it seems that they didn't have any problem. They destroyed a rim, as you can see, and had to come into the pits. But the pit change wins okay. They put another wheel on, and it seems like the drive shafts are okay. Just uh, get a quick look at Peter Brock's slap board as it comes in. See what time his crew are giving him. Well, there's a time of 1.45.3. Now, we know that Larry hasn't done many laps around here, and he's, uh, he's certainly done the lion's share of the work on the car, whereas Peter's done the lion's share of the test driving. But uh, 10 seconds is going to be uh, not too too uh, good for the team if he's going to lose that much time. But it's only a few laps into the race and uh, into the stint for Larry Perkins and he'll be just making sure that he keeps that car in one piece. Realistically, he's in for a top three placing, but uh, every one of us are hoping that it's a, a top of the rung place. I think they're just about to give him another lap time. We'll see in just a moment, but Peter Brock's crew, I think, are about to give him another lap time of 45.9, which well, we is saw there. Yeah, Robbie Fenisovic the going past Larry Perkins very quickly there. He was a long way behind, just caught him up, just passed him without any problem at all. So maybe... Larry's got a bit of a problem in the car because yeah. the Fernisovic is pulling away. We have to assume at this stage that it's just Larry Perkins getting to grips with the circuit and getting the car dialed in for him, but that really is a long way off the pace and too far off the pace to continue. Yes, uh, it's most surprising indeed. The Alpha uh, is uh, holding onto the tail of him at the moment. Okay, it's... 43.9, I think we have unofficially on the last one. Let's see what his uh, pit crew give him as their time. We'll have a look this time around as he comes past. Yes, 43.9, they got the same time as we did. Now that's really still a long way off the pace. It's two seconds quicker than the last lap and there's a fair amount of traffic there, but Larry Perkins is gonna have to pick that up. Yes, well, Ken Fajans is in the lead at the moment driving exceptionally well and he knows his car so we'd expect to be pulling away very very quickly away from Larry Perkins. Well, remembering the problem that Peter had yesterday in practice was the, uh, an excessive amount of wear on his camshaft components, camshaft rockers and it made the car sound extremely flat. It was obviously losing valve lift. Now when it went by our commentary position on the last lap it had that flat sound to it which really is indicative of uh, a tremendous loss of horsepower but uh, Let's just stick with the time. We see a 43.4 about to go out for Peter on the next, sorry, to Larry on the next lap. So we'll try and get some information from the Peter Brock team. And just Peter, Larry Perkins has gone off at the uh, foul house hairpin. No real damage that we can see. Obviously the plastic spoiler. No, he's stopped it in time. Well, that would suggest that he's having a, maybe a handling problem or a braking problem. He's, he, the tyres aren't uh, appearing to be uh, flattened or damaged in any way, but I, Larry not enjoying his drive just yet. I think I agree with you, David, with the power, because... Um, Let's watch the replay. Just having a look at it again, he wasn't forced in there at all. I think he just braked a bit late at the apex and just didn't turn as well as he should have done. The right yeah, leader is in trouble. The right front tyre has obviously come right off the rim. He's getting along the road. And that's going to be extremely hard to drive that car back to the pits because he's off the rim. He's Let's got a long way car. to go back. He's got a long way to go back to the pits too, so he'd lose probably a lap or more of doing this. And we've just seen the Wilk uh, Crichton go past and now the BMW. So wow, Ken Bajan will be furious about this and how he gets over that bridge. He's going to be a mobile chicane. Well, that's uh, intriguing. Are they going to let him that's continue well, right around the circuit and try and get over that bridge? Well, he's going to be it's a bit tight to turn. Yeah, it's going to be very difficult, especially when he turns the, the left-hander, when he turns onto the bridge. Well, that's the most extremely flat spot in tyre that I've ever seen, but, and uh, it's testing the ability of Dunlop's racing tyres to the limit. Also, but it's still turning, so uh, 
flapping about there. It's doing damage to the mudguard, obviously, but uh, he's obviously going to have a go at getting to the pits. That's the what wrist, endurance racing is all about. The wrist suspension could be rubbing on the ground here, could be wearing away. So not only could there be the damage of losing a wheel and tyre, the, the car could be, the disc and all the rest of it may eventually well, start scraping on the ground. The wheel's not turning, is it? No, no he's... Skating on magnesium at the moment. He's can gonna, he get he, through it? Can he turn the left-hander? Oh, he has. He's just done it. He's holding up everybody else behind him in the biggest way possible. Now, well, that Volvo got held up for quite a few seconds there. Robbie Fenisovic won't be very happy about that. Well, yeah. This brings the Volvo back quite in contention in this race. We know that Larry Perkins is out there, but not driving very quickly. We see a time now of actually... 151 on the board for Larry Perkins. Now that seems incredibly slow, but uh, he had the off. Yes, but Larry Perkins was also being caught by that Alpha at the time that he was doing so. The Alpha appeared quicker. Let's watch this pit stop now with Kent Bajan still in the car. A new right front wheel going on the car. The air, the air jacks obviously working to their best advantage here. Obviously no suspension damage because they put that wheel and tyre on. Um, I'm surprised they didn't do a quick inspection there because anything could have uh, been broken underneath. Certainly would have saved, saved some time later on, but they've yeah. taken the gamble. They put a wheel straight on it and they're going to go back out. Yeah, well, Ken Bajan's a very good driver. He's won four Group A races in a row many times before. And uh, he hasn't lost as much time as we thought. Well, having a look at that wheel in slow motion down the straight, I would suspect, without being critical to Ken, that he's hit a curve because the wheel was actually quite deformed in its uh, rim, rim shape before, uh, well, when we saw the side on shot. So it might have been a curving incident that uh, caused that deflation and separation of the tyre from the rim. These tyres have a tendency when they overheat to um, start shredding, and I think that if they did that and he turned into a corner a bit quickly, then it would slide out and, he could, and the rim could easily hit a curb. But uh, these compounds are quite soft, and on a hot day like we're getting now, as the temperatures are getting up, as the afternoon carries on, uh, a lot more tyre problems could be uh, seen by different competitors. 87 well, laps completed now by the front runners. Well, they're in the pits still. I think they may be going to jack that car up to fix some suspension damage. Here we, here we have race leader Larry Perkins in a Holden Commodore. Now that's really astonishing after the very slow lap times that Larry Perkins has turned in for the last three. He's still in the the lead by virtue of the fact that Ken Bajan had that tyre disintegrate on him. Well, this race has got everything. This, this is Sport 500. Well, this Nissan Sport 500 has got everything for the fans here. The, the positions have changed amazingly. It's just like a sprint race. The drivers are driving it like a sprint race. There's all this action. Wheels off, gearboxes braking, drive shafts braking. And it would appear that the Brock Commodore, as we said earlier, has the same problem that it had yesterday. It's lost valve lift at one of the cylinders. It's now down on seven cylinders, in fact. So uh, it's, a, it's going to be a test of the General's fine product if it's sufficiently good enough to get to the end. And that's an hour and a half away. We've got an interesting race now because uh, Frank Sittner, who's still uh, with uh, John Morton on this car, still circulating out there. And uh, Robbie Benitovic on the Volvo is still out there. So the uh, race lead could change. Into the pits we just have had Gary Pedersen for his scheduled fuel stop and I think that he ran that as fine as he could do so because he was wiggling the wheel in order to get the car to get to the pits before it actually ran out of petrol. So watch the fuel, fuel stop, Dave McMillan kitting out. It appears they're only going to change front tyres, fuel going in. The breather bottle on the right hand side is to avoid any spillage and uh, let the air out as you can appreciate with 40 litres of petrol being poured in such a hurry it displaces a fair amount of air and that is why the plastic bottle on the right hand side is used as a safety measure to make sure that no fuel and gas spills out they've also checked the underneath with the drive shafts and they're also checking the disc pads and i noticed the mechanic on the left hand side had a look at the uh, calipers in the drive shaft and now he's got a rag and underneath there is some problem some problem on the front so this is going to be a very long pit stop and the excellent position they had is going to waste away as their time and the pits gets longer and longer they've been unlucky enough earlier on in the year to have some problems with drive shafts but they seem to have that six the last time they had a problem it was the fuel pickup they weren't getting enough fuel pressure 
That'll be an awful shame if they have to spend too long in the pits because they were doing an excellent job leading the two and a half litre class. Well, I would say the happiest man out there at the moment must be Paul Adams. His little Toyota is running around like a Swiss clock. He's had, I don't believe he's even stopped at this point because he's still in the car, so we assume that he hasn't stopped and handed over to Alan Wolf yet. And that car is just running beautifully. Let's not forget that Neville Crichton is still out there and circulating despite the panel damage on the front of that vehicle. And should be in third place. Confirm that for you in just a moment. Every car here has sustained some kind of mechanical or panel damage, it seems. Almost everybody has had a coming together with the tyres or the bridge or some little aspect of this course. Well, it has been a sprint race, Tony. It's not a long-distance race. These drivers are driving flat out, and a lot of the damage they've inflicted upon each other, especially turning into the tight corners. So it's uh, a long-distance race. We thought we were going to see what we've seen as a very long sprint race. is the order after 89 laps. Larry Perkins in the Commodore, John Morton in the BMW, and Neville Crichton in the other BMW. A lap there of 1 minute 37 for John Morton in the uh, number 6 BMW. So John Morton running on time, keeping the schedule. A time of about 136, 137 is... About good running time at this point of the race. Yes, we should actually put a clock on the Volvo and see how fast it is going because um, I noticed as we're watching these pictures, it's just passing cars left, right and centre. And the performance of Michelle Delcour early on in the race is now being repeated by Robbie Panisovic. And uh, he doesn't like being held up by the other competitors and he's given them the uh, appropriate uh, signal to make sure they don't do it again when he comes to lap them again in a few laps time. Robbie Finisovic doing remarkably well in this car, Tony, for the number of laps that he had in practice. I think that the car is remarkable in itself. It's an absolutely amazed me how they could get it straight off the plane, go straight out there and be on competitive lap times, and then turn up at the, uh, the race today, go off the back of the grid, well under the pole setting time of Dick Johnson, and just carve their way right through the field. Did it beautifully. Well. They've, uh, they've still got a pretty good chance in this race because Peter Perfect Croft and uh, Larry Perkins and the Holden Commodore are running into trouble out on the circuit with uh, their camshaft. Their lap times have dropped right back. This Volvo, if it keeps circulating without going into the pits anymore, has got a very good chance of coming through at the end of the four. 109, 199 lap, 150 laps is going to be in four hours. Larry Perkins circulating around now. I notice as he comes past the pits here, he's got his elbow out the window as if it's a Sunday afternoon drive. Obviously, the pace is not too hot. Well, the amount of power he's got, Tony, is probably only equivalent to about six cylinders. So, he's, uh, he, Barry Perkins is a racer, and he doesn't really like cruising, and he wouldn't be very happy about just cruising around out there, so he's making this sort of known to everybody how he feels. Well, our unofficial lap score is going to a position a few laps ago, which shows Larry Perkins to be leading from John Morton, with Michelle Delcorbe or Reese Robbie Francovic in this Volvo in third place and the sensational Toyota sprinter of Paul Adams in fourth place. And that looks pretty good, so we'll have to just wait and see what the computer thinks of all that. I think after all the talking stops, the story of the race, the highlight of the race, is going to be Paul Adams placing if he continues circulating the way he is now. It's an absolutely superb performance in a 1600cc car. Here's Larry Perkins. Still wandering around the circuit, and I think wandering is the right word. It's really not on the pace. Bob Holt just being passed there. And the other Toyota Corolla GT Sprinter. Not a mark on the VK Commodore yet. Larry Perkins and Peter Brock showing the class of driving. They've had a minor off, but Larry Perkins managed to stay away from enough solid objects not to damage the panel work. Well, I've just got to bring you a lap time, which is nothing short of sensational for Robbie Francovic and the flying brick 
on the door, the Volvo 131.75. Now that car is the fastest car on the track. It was earlier on today. It was the sensation of unofficial practice. And a time like that could easily bring us back into the lead contention. Remembering that this man, Larry Perkins, now there's the lead. Well, unofficially, we would see the match of the lead taken by Robbie Francovic in the Volvo. Even if, it is a la even if he's a lap down, um, even if he's a lap down, at the speed that he passed Peter Brock, he could easily unlap himself again and take the lead. So a very good leader coming up. First thing I think I'll do tomorrow morning is take David Oxton's stopwatch down and get it fixed because it keeps turning up so many unbelievable times. This one has just become more believable when you see how fast Robbie Francovic is circulating in that Volvo. Yesterday, if we'd seen a time like this, we'd have thrown it out and said, no, no, must be something wrong with that. Today, you can believe it because that Volvo certainly is the fastest car on the track, and that's a phenomenal time at this stage of the race. 131.5 is just crazy. Well, as much as, as, much as I've uh, obviously believed Robbie Francovic's talent has come to hand, but that fact is still Michelle Del Court driving the car. Now, we, we can't see his overalls at this point. An open face helmet worn by both drivers, and it's a little bit hard to make it clear. But uh, an error there, I think we've... I spoke a bit too soon in thinking that uh, the lead had been taken by Del Court. In fact, he has just unlapped himself from Larry Perkins, and that would really still leave him in the same position. But with the, the sort of lap times he's doing, if that is to be able to be kept up to the end of the race, it's going to be one heck of a finish to see where this Volvo finishes at the final standing. Well, obviously what they're doing in this race, they're running as long as they can in terms of the three and a half, three hours driving time before Robbie Finitsevic gets in. And when they come in the pits for the last time, Robbie will take over. And they're obviously going to leave Michelle Delcour out for as long as possible. Paul Adams is in the pits. We've just seen him come in with the, really, the drive of the day. Let's see how their pit stop goes because this, to me, is the drive of the day. It really is. A 1600cc car in class three, not only leading his own class, but the two and a half litre class as well. And in fifth place overall, unofficially in fourth place, we think it's fifth. Whichever it is, overall to be fourth or fifth in that Toyota Corolla is just astonishing. Bird drive, it's Alan Wolf out of the car now, I think. Paul Adams, father in law. Yes, yep. it is. Alan Wolf in the car. Let's see if he does the same lap times as Paul Adams. Well, he's capable of doing them in past experience. Alan Wolf is more of a circuit racer than a rally driver, and um, he's proven in Benson and Hedges racing and all sorts of short distance and long distance racing. He's on. He is one of the most competitive drivers you have in this country, and even at his 37 years of age, plus another 10, we reckon, um, yes. he's still pretty Adams. quick. There's Paul Adams just having hopped out of the car with a big smile on his face, as well he might have. We'll try and get a word with him very shortly, with Graham Booth down in the pits. But uh, Paul Adams would have to be happy with that performance. With some of these drivers, it's very difficult to tell who's in the car at which time, because with the full-face helmet on, it's very hard to see their faces. In this case, it's not difficult, because Alan Wolf is about a foot shorter than Paul Adams. So you can see by where he sits in the car. We're talking about big and small, certainly Michelle, Michelle Delcourt is a big man with a big heart. Obviously got big something or others to drive this car and the speed he's doing too. The car is obviously a fantastic car suited to this track and it's what we said yesterday, it's a horsepower track and as long as that can be coupled with traction and reliability, it's obviously going to help the, uh, the guy to win the race. So Larry Perkins still circulating off the pace and off the cams, not working terribly well. And we also have just behind Peter Brock, it's Frank Sittner, and he is closing in on, sorry, Ian Larry Perkins. Let's just see how close, how fast uh, John Morton closes in on Larry Perkins. John Morton uh, closing in very quickly on uh, Larry Perkins, Tony. It's obviously that the, the Commodore has a problem. Yes, I think as soon as they get through the bridge complex, if not before, that uh, John Morton will get in front of Larry Perkins. Already in second place anyway. 
have a look for it here. Yeah, the Commodore was way down on power yesterday and early on in the race. That BMW would not have been able to pass that Commodore like that. So Larry Perkins has only got the equivalent of six cylinders at the moment. It's still circulating well and cleanly and they hope to finish the race. After 95 laps, the order is Michelle Delcour in the Volvo leading John Morton in the BMW in second place. Peter Brock still registering as third place and Paul Adams now in fourth place. Turbo. What a car and what a race they've had. Yes, Three visits to the pits. Yes, and, and one of them a lengthy one too, Tony. Over a lap in the pits they spent, this, it is an absolutely superb drive. It was simply amazing to watch in the early stages of the race, to watch them driving through, just carving their way through the field. Well, if what Robbie Finisevich says is that Michel Delcourt wants to prove himself in New Zealand so that he can get his works ride back in Europe, then he's doing that today. Now, the order as we make it at the moment, Michel Delcourt in first place on 96 laps. John Morton in second place on 95. Larry Perkins was in third place on 93 laps. We think he's just been passed by uh, Neville Crichton in the BMW. Check that in a moment, who was on 92 laps. Paul Adams in fifth place on 92 laps. Kevin Ryan in sixth place on 89. Steve Williams in seventh place on 88. And Glenn McIntyre on 87 laps in eighth place. Well, that's very good for Kevin Ryan and the Nissan Bluebird Turbo. They did only expected to just finish, but by uh, keeping going without problems, they've climbed right up into sixth place. Okay, let's go down to the pits and see if we can find out from the master himself, Peter Brock, just what the problem was with that car, or still is with the car. Well, Peter, we've seen the HDD Commodore dropping back a bit. Tell us about the problems it's having. Well, uh, just actually, I have been nursing a bit of a problem there uh, from our lap 10. It was very fluffy. The engine just had a strain. And I had just very little horsepower up the straights. But uh, the handling and braking of the car was great, and I was able to remain in a pretty competitive sort of spot. And we've had one scheduled pit stop. As I came in, the engine went off song. And uh, I, I mean, it was a lap I came in. It's obviously broken something on the valve train. Uh, something there's no doubt we can fix up for Pukekohe, but uh, poor old Larry's just having a drive around there. Actually, we're still up near the front somewhere, and uh, if he can just keep on driving around there, uh, the engine keeps on going. We're nursing to the finish. We can finish somewhere pretty good. Just going to hang on in there, please. Yeah, we're not going to give him that a fight, but uh, we, we've, that's a debut race, uh, and uh, halfway through a race around the streets like this, we're actually in front. We're pretty happy with that as well he might be in the world premiere of the car in group a form never been raced anywhere else in the world in this form you must be happy with that kind of placing and that kind of performance and even if the car is down on horsepower just a little it's encouraging to see that it's obviously going to be a good handler and it stops well well as peter said tony it's uh, he's looking to book a curry now remembering that this street race is in fact one of a two race series of the Nissan race series and the second round being a book and Curry next weekend. Uh, we won't be there with television, but uh, these drivers certainly will be, and they're going to make sure that uh, they make up for some lost performances, I would imagine. Some of the front stars who've uh, had mechanical troubles uh, will be a bit uh, put out by this, and they'll look forward to making up that performance of a, a, an all-out contest at book and Curry. He's been in now four times, remembering, and uh, this is his stop, maybe a scheduled stop, and this is where we'll see Robbie Prancevic of New Zealand take over the driving role. Look at the size of that man, Michel Delcourt. Yes, it certainly uh, doesn't seem to make any difference. It's not like single-seaters where you need a fellow that looks like a jockey to go faster than somebody who's a little big. And Michel Delcourt is a big fellow. And this uh, uh, car, being a left-hand drive car and uh, a left-hand circuit, it probably doesn't affect the handling too much, but on a circuit that's probably a right-handed circuit, with a lot of right-hand corners, it'll probably affect a bit, but here it doesn't at all. This, oh, this team have got a bit of fuel spillage there, so they might have to mop that up and lose a bit of time. The organisers are making them uh, clean it up. They've got a problem. Well, this is a bit of a shame. They're losing a lot of time here. The organisers are going to make them clean everything up. 
They're going to lose time. Let's see how fast Robbie Francovic can make it go for Shell Del Coeur. As we said, he's about six feet one and about 15 and a half, 16 stone. He's a very big chap. Obviously, the uh, weight disadvantage doesn't affect the car with this amount of horsepower. They've had a problem changing the right rear tyre too. That took a long time, so it's a very long pit stop, but with the speed of the motor car, it shouldn't affect it too much. Well, Keith, the uh, pit time was one minute and four seconds, which is not quick, but it's not badly slow. Uh, I would think you can add to that about another 15 seconds for Robbie Francovic to dial himself in on the first three or four laps. Whilst that team was actually, whilst uh, the Volvo team had the Volvo engineer out here, that team was just put together in this the stretch of a few days it was only decided a week ago that the car would be coming and in fact the team was hastily put together jacks made air harnesses their tools all sorts of equipment had to be put together and remember the car already arrived actually in wellington last night and so there wasn't much time realistically to do a pit practice so one minute for the, for the first pit stop in new zealand is not bad at all i think we should also talk about the owner of this motor car it's mark pitch and he was going to co-drive the car, but he decided to let Robbie Panisovic and Michelle Del Cor drive it here. And later on, Mark intends to campaign this car in Group A motor racing in New Zealand and possibly Australia. So Mark Pitch uh, was originally going to get a Rover to bring out here and uh, changed his mind to get a Volvo, and he's made an excellent choice. So one up to you, Mark. Uh, you look like you've got a very good Group A car for the future. Gary Pedersen, uh, who handed over to Dave McMillan at the last pit change. Dave McMillan has just had an off on the circuit there, which we saw the tail end of as the Volvo went past. Dave McMillan possibly having a little trouble getting to grips with the car as well. Must be very, very difficult to step in a car after somebody has come in, somebody who's done the last 70 or 80 laps and consistently to hop in the car and try and go out and emulate it. Well, of course, the temptation is that, you know, you've been watching the lap boards of your co-driver and you know what pace he's done, and your immediate thing is to go and switch on, and you feel when you get out there, you'll be passed by everyone, and you really have to pace yourself and give yourself a bit of a kick in the pants and say, hold it, let's get ready for this as a, as a long distance race, and let's not try and wreck the car in one lap. Unfortunately, Dave's gone a bit wide, obviously up at the escape road there with the Fiat, but no damage done, he's still running round and uh, the little front wheel fit is built strongly. It should be able to take a fair amount of curry from Dave. And the Belgian fellow who has just hopped out of the car. No, in fact, we'll come to that in a moment. Just running through the order at the moment, John Morton in the Morton Simpson BMW in the lead on 101 laps. Michelle Delcour, who has handed over to Robbie Francovic in the car at the moment, the Volvo on 99 laps. Larry Perkins on 98. And Wayne Wilkinson, Neville Crichton, Neville Crichton in the car at the moment on 97, along with Paul Adams in the Toyota. Well, this yes. race of attrition is certainly dealing with some blows to the fancy runners, but here's our race leader, John Morton from Auckland, in the BMW 635, the one driven by Frank Pittler originally in the early part of the race. Frank, John Morton doing a great job. He's started with minis or laser sports and then came up through the ranks of Commodores and negotiated to get this drive with Frank Sittner on behalf of Metro and Johnson BMW of Auckland. Also notice out there the uh, Bajan car also circulated, got back on the circuit circulating again but uh, they've lost a lot of time and uh, I think it'd be interesting to resist racing Ken Bajan and make sure that he just gets his car to the finish. Everything's going all right for them at the moment. They haven't had any of these problem pit stops. The old John Morton, well, just as we were talking about him, he got enthusiastic and he's nearly cost himself the lead. Trying to find reverse gear. Oh, well. Yes, he, uh, hopefully he had to find it. Luckily he didn't do any damage and maybe that's just the fright that he needs to slow down and be careful. Lucky also that no one was coming through that fast corner from Jervois Key because it's a blind corner and uh, to have seen John Morton across the road like that would have caused a problem or two. Now, I suspect it was that he saw Ken Bajan in front of him close enough to have a go and perhaps the temptation was too great. Well, it's right. The temptation would have been there for John Morton and he would have seen himself closing and he just tried a little bit harder and uh, he nearly cost himself the lead. Just have another look at it. 
John Morton not very far at all behind oh. Kent Bacon, <laughs> just losing the tail. Very lucky just indeed not to get that curb, Tony. Very lucky that there was nobody coming through as well. He managed to get clear road for long enough to find reverse gear and do a three-point turn and get going again. But lucky on several counts, he didn't hit anything and there was nobody coming through to cause him any danger. Well, maybe that's just the fright that he needs to settle down and get this car home to win the race. I mean, there's been so many lead changes, so much action in this distance 4 500 race. What John Morton's got to do now is keep out of the action and finish without problems. Well, it's two hours, 40 minutes of race distance. We have a lap time for Robbie Francovic in car 11, the Volvo, 135.2 seconds. So whilst that's not as fast as Michel Delcourt, it's a very good time considering Robbie's familiarity with both the vehicle and the circuit. Intriguing to see if he gets down at the same time as Michel Delcourt as the day goes on. Yes, uh, wouldn't, I think that's expected to do at this early stage. No, I think it'd be very difficult, Tony. It's a left-hand drive motor car. The tyres must start wearing later on, and uh, it'd be very difficult for Robbie to achieve that. But John Morton is uh, very erratic. He better settle down, or uh, he's going to see this race lead out the window with a bent wheel or something else like that. Very, very easy on a street circuit at any stage to ruin wheels and drive shafts and front suspension as well because the moment you lose it, you're liable to hit a curb or something solid. Well, being left-hand driver can't be easy for John. I mean, it's all very well to sit here and criticise him, but uh, to hop in a very powerful motor car like that with so few laps on, one, on the most difficult driving and challenging circuit that we've ever had in New Zealand and for many a time, um, good on you, John, just be careful. Okay, the order as we make it at the moment. John Morton having lost the lead. The little spin there. Almost lost the lead, should we say. He's still holding on to it. John Morton first. Delcour second. Brock, uh, the Brock Commodore in third place. And then Neville Crichton, the BMW fourth. Paul Adams in fifth place. 103 first and 20 seconds behind. With a great deal more than 20 seconds, 20 laps remaining really uh, adds up to a race win for them. But that, uh, of course, assumes that everything goes well for the rest of the afternoon. Just a point of interest for this uh, inaugural street race for Wellington. It's brought out all of the people, all the motoring enthusiasts, and even some new ones I see in the crowds. Jim McClay and Mike Moore representing the parliamentarians in the capital city. And it's great to see such support from the national people. I mean, the capital city people, the Wellington City Council are really behind it. And we understand they're sitting up there in the Michael Fowler Centre, really ecstatic about the, the racing in the streets. Also, you have to think they have the harbour board as well, because they did a lot of work in uh, uh, being part of this. Here is the race leader, John Morton, really needing to settle down, as Reg Cook said a few laps ago. He seems to have settled into a pace now. Rather difficult for him, hopping in a left-hand left drive car, and uh, a car that he is unfamiliar with racing. He's really had very, very few laps in the car to get familiar with it. But having the race lead and knowing that they can hold him by consistent lap times, uh, the pressure is really on John Morton to sit in consistent lap times. The race doesn't have a word with Paul Adams. To me, this is the drive of the day. Well, Paul Adams, fifth overall and little car that allegedly in the baby class is absolutely amazing. How are you doing it? Oh, well, we're very pleased that uh, the car is handling superbly and stopping superbly. Um, I think the track width has been very tight and a lot of curves uh, suits us. And uh, as long as it's kept going, I think it'll last even finish even higher up. This is the still same little motor car used for rallying, isn't it? Yes, identical to the, the same car. We have a different uh, suspension in it for rallies, obviously, but uh, basically that's the only difference. What do you reckon this is? Is it a race or a rally? What sort of a technique do you require to get round here? Or a bit of both, perhaps? Uh, possibly a bit of both. It, it is definitely a race. It's very important to have the correct lines on the track because uh, any little bit of area, you'll flip a curve. This is becoming particularly more so now that the race is getting on because there's a lot of uh, gravel, etc., on there off the line. And I think that's where a lot of them are damaging their cars. They slip out into the slippery stuff and, uh, and they clip a stone wall. So what's your plan now, Paul? Hang on in there till the end? Yeah, Alan's uh, going to hopefully stay out there until the end, drive as hard as he can and uh, just see where we finish. 
So Paul Adams having handed over to his father-in-law, Alan Wolf, now in the car, in your picture, and sitting in fifth place. This is where the, the no, brake wear will tell. We're going to the front end of the car, so let's must... assume the brakes are a question. Well, if I think you'd assume that he's probably got a puncture on the right front. He's probably hit a curve or something like that. And uh, also, so uh, I think that'd be the problem there. A marked difference between the big, expensive BMW Group A cars that just come in and plug it in air hose and the air jacks on the car jack it up. Alan Wolf and uh, Paul Adams crew having to jack it up with a floor jack. They've got a healthy lead in their class back to uh, their fifth position. There's nearly five laps between them and sixth position, so they can afford to spend a bit of time in the pits and fix whatever's wrong properly before they go out. Bruce has Sky TV. And closing very, very fast indeed. Wow, it's an exciting motor race, Tony. Um, the lead has just changed so many times, and for, for a race to be going this distance and to have something to talk about for the whole time is really surprising. And, so maybe street circuits are uh, excitement from one end of the concept to the other. Let's not forget our black BMW, the JPS car, holding third place, not on your screen at the moment, but in spite of all the troubles with half shafts and uh, all sorts of unfortunate troubles for Neville Crichton, he's now in the car, of course, and he's running the final stint. Wayne Wilkinson have been, having driven first, and we have Neville Crichton in third place. So that's BMW's first and third, with the Volvo in between, the flying brick. The gap between first and second really narrowing. John Morton through your picture now. Now look back for Robbie Francivic in the Volvo. Yes, if we could just get a time on uh, John Morton in uh, comparison between him and Pranicevic, it would be uh, interesting to see just how fast he's closing in. Well, Robbie Francivic was down to 133 odd, so he's comfortably a second quicker. And 135 for John Morton. So we've got a, a two second differential on a lap speed. So realistically, the, uh, the Volvo is the fastest car on the track still. And with Robbie Francivic driving, only a little bit slower than Michael Michael Belcourt. Just the point we should inform you of uh, before it gets too close to the time is that at four o'clock we will be leaving this race, whether finished or not, to go to the cricket. We will show you either live or recorded. We will show you the last stages and the finish of the race, of course, and what happens at the dying laps of it. But at four o'clock we are required to leave this and to go to the cricket. So in case you wanted to make any plans in that direction, we will show you the race, but maybe not live yet. We don't know. There's John Morton waiting now for this gap, which is closing so fast. Robbie Francivic right on his tail. Yeah, Comfortably a second to a second and a half quicker a lap. It'll only be a matter of time the next few laps before he's passed. Robbie Finisevic is the kind of person that if he sees another driver in front of him, especially John Morton, he gets all fired up. And he knows Robbie's trying a lot harder now. And it wouldn't be surprised me if Robbie doesn't start getting close to Michelle Delcour's lap times because Robbie's fired up. He sees the lap lead. He sees John Morton as ex partner and he sees a race victory and he is determined and he's using a lot of road now well there's absolutely nobody on the circuit who has gone within cooey of michelle del Cour's time he has been the fastest man on the circuit all day robbie francivic starting to approach those times now we had him down under 133 there are only two drivers, remember, who have gone under 133 on this circuit. One of them being Dick Johnson setting the pole qualifying time. And the other being Michelle Delcour, who did better than that and did 131.9. It'd be interesting when Robbie closes in on John Morton and the BMW to see whether John gets pressurised into making a mistake because the BMW was a bit shaky when he first hopped in it. It'd be easy for uh, John to try and race Robbie and make a mistake and uh, end up a casualty in the race. Yes, it's absolutely inevitable that uh, Robbie Francivic is going to catch him. I just wonder how long it will take to get past him and what happens at that time. Yes. It's intriguing. We'll watch the battle. Anything can happen. One of these cars can end up making a slight mistake and uh, punch it. Anything can happen. 117 laps completed now. Well, this Mrs. Sport 500 race is definitely not over, and the excitement is uh, increasing is with every lap with this particular jewel of 
ex-friends and great rivals. John Morton must see Robbie Pranisovic closing in. He will be starting to increase his speed and anything's possible. It must, it must be a, a really quite a hard thing to take when you're sitting in a car driving it and each time round you see the lap, the pit board that tells you how close the person well, behind you is getting. Well, both these, John Morton won't want Robbie to catch it, but there's very little he can do about it. He will start breaking a little bit deeper driving a little bit harder and uh, he just has to be careful he doesn't make any mistakes. Robbie Cranston coming up to the left with John Power, BK Commodore, John Power and Lou McKinnon and this BK Commodore not quite up to the standard of Peter Crofts. It's only their first effort in Group A racing but they built the car in something like seven weeks and for the benefit of this race at least they thought they would run it on road radials, just Firestone road radials to make sure that they could uh, Save the enormous tyre bill whilst they're learning to drive it, but a very good effort by these two lads in the Phillips car. We have to be careful, uh, they may actually be on Dunlop C, they were going to make a change, a decision right before the races, we ran Firestone or Dunlop, so initially they were going to run on Firestones, but the latest thing we heard before the race started, they could be on either, so we just have to be careful on that point. Okay, this battle at the front about to occur. Here is Robbie Francovic closing very, very quickly on John Morton. There's John Morton. Robbie Francovic right on his tail, closing with his slap. By the end of this lap, expect them to be right together, and then the fireworks start. Will John Morton allow him to go past and be happy with that, or will he not? Yes. Bear in mind that the winner of this race gets $20,000. Far more money than anybody that I know of has raced for in New Zealand before. Yes, Robbie Fenisovic getting a bit twitchy there, coming onto the straight. If Robbie Frenzovic and Michelle Delcourt were to win this race, whilst it is $20,000 to win, that would go some way towards paying the air freight bill which has brought the car to New Zealand. Reportedly $25,000 worth of air freight to get it to Auckland. That's a little better than winning prize money that uh, might, if you were lucky, pay for your brake pad. Getting very, very close now. We'll watch this battle with interest. Michelle Delcour, fast enough, close enough now to get past. Yes, the, Some unusual spectating views there. The uh, Volvo showing its superior top speed because of the extra horsepower on the straight there. But with turbo lag, may not be quite as quick out of the corners. Now, Robbie Francovic, I noticed, getting about the same amount of oversteer as uh, Michelle Delcour was with this Volvo. Seems to be a little tail happy, but doesn't uh, doesn't look out of control it really looks like that's the way you've got to drive it with turbo power the power comes in sort of gradually in these cars because they don't run very high boost so you don't normally get power that over slides initially when you put your foot down well they're getting closer the bmw was seemingly better handling the volvo with more horsepower hello the uh, Volvo handles fairly good around the top fast corners, Tony. Just a matter of time. Well, at the rate that Robbie Francovic was closing in, he's really steadied up just a little in the last lap and a half. Now, this is two New Zealanders fighting for the lead. John Morton from New Zealand, co-driving in Frank Sittner's car. And Robbie Francovic co-driving in... The entry with Michelle Delcour from Belgium. So uh, New Zealanders fighting out first and second place at the moment. Down this straight is where you're going to see the extra power of the Volvo Turbo come in to its own near the end of the straight. It's a matter of what can happen under braking. I wonder if this is tactics from Robbie Francovic. He was closing quick enough to have gone past half a lap ago. Yes, uh, I, think, I think he got blocked a bit there by the uh, Willie Jane's Toyota GT and it's a bit difficult for Robbie to get through then. You'll have to wait another lap to the same point on that straight. Well, everybody's had a shot at leading this race, and uh, even different drivers are dri on the driver combinations, but it looks at this point as if Robbie Francovic is poised to take the lead from John Morton, the two North Shore drivers, in their respective European entered cars. I'm not quite sure what Robbie Francovic's tactics oh, are. He can't, he, 
he has turbo lag, Tony, so it doesn't get out of the corners too quickly. So I think he's really got to wait until he gets on the straight in front How of the Michael the Fowler centre. For a passing manoeuvre. Well, John Morton sweating it out with him. He's, uh, he's, he's uh, chopped him off. So it's going to be down the back straight in front of the Malcolm, Malcolm Fowler centre, which has a great number of celebrities. In fact, here it is. John Morton went too wide there, and Robbie Fleece has just got through. Okay, look again, I'll try and replay that incident for you. The passing manoeuvre, John Morton went too close into the tyre, forced himself to go wide. As you see, he's in tight, trying to keep inside the little Isuzu Gemini, forcing himself out wide, and in comes Robbie Francovic, up the inside, hard left block, and booting it out, takes the lead off John Morton. So the lead changes yet again in the Nissan Sport 500. The leader now is Robbie Francovic. Robbie Francovic and Michelle Delcour driving the Volvo. That's the third time it has been in the lead, having started off the back of the grid. John Please. Morton has dropped away dramatically from Robbie Francovic, whether that's just Robbie putting the boot down to show how much lead he can put up, but uh, John Morton is visibly dropping away. In fact, he's off our screen. Yes, I think Robbie uh, is doing a bit of his normal showmanship and uh, trying very hard. He, he'll have to, his pits will be hanging out a sign, slow down, slow down, Robbie, and uh, well, they might. That was really why I wondered at the tactics, Rich, because that's going past Ken Bajan. Look at this. That's I wondered at the tactics because when you see them together there, it has enough front to get past the BMW quite comfortably. I wonder if Robbie was sitting around in the back there waiting to see if John Morton would make a mistake. Yeah, it's an interesting theory, Allard. Robbie's the kind of man, if he can get the lead, he likes to be there. He, he wouldn't like to leave it for too long. He might have, it might have been possible, but I would doubt it. The normally super reliable BMWs are, appear to be slowing on us. We both, we've got Kent Bajan waving by Robbie Francovic earlier in the lap there. And we know that John Morton has actually dropped back probably five or six seconds already from Robbie Francovic. So maybe a, a couple of problems uh, appearing in the normally invincible BMWs. Well, Kent Bajan's car, they had to change part of the suspension, I would see. And uh, Kent Bajan's going to a trouble. standstill. We'll stay with this car at the moment. Kent Bajan obviously has a fairly serious problem. We before, and his lap times are consistent, and that's allowed them to come from right way down the field up into the third position they're doing now. So uh, very lucky that, that accident was only superficial damage. That's Stray Galton into the pits in the Alpha. What a sensational for Robbie Francovic in the Volvo, 131.9. Now that is an incredible lap time. He matched the time identically of his co-driver, Michelle Delcourt. And clearly this Volvo is, a, is running away with the race and nothing seems like capable, nothing else seems capable of staying with him, let alone catching him. And so uh, Robbie Francovic, as fast as the, uh, as we said, as the Belgian co-driver. So let's keep an eye on the pace of Robbie Francovic in the Volvo. We hear that uh, Robbie is a very determined driver, as we know, and he came on the inside of Peter Brock at the hairpin and just forced him out. Robbie is the kind of person who likes to lead and likes to do well. And uh, when he comes up against Peter Brock, who was probably uh, raced against in Bathurst, he took the advantage and took the incentive and... Uh, put Peter in his place, so to speak, and Robbie would be very happy about that, but it would be interesting to hear what the stewards have got to say. Pure grunt when put into a big chassis can do. One of the interesting cars that we should see will be George Fury is uh, hoping to homologate or run a Skyline, Nissan Skyline, and run it in Australia against Peter Brock and his Commodores, so the, uh, the racing that's going to go on in Bathurst next year will be transferred to this street circuit at this time, hopefully in a year. Bit of a sideways there for John Morton. Didn't seem to clip anything with the right rear tyre, oh, but there's certainly some marks on the rim, which he might have done some other time. Yes, White yes. marks indicate that he's rubbed something there. Well, hopefully he hasn't got a puncher coming up out of that. Coming up on Larry Perkins in the UDC. Let's watch this on replay, just see how close. Very, very close. Now, in fact, let's... 
Well, he's certainly done some sort of a touch on there, but uh, from this angle, we can't tell whether there's well, any serious damage to that. That wheel rim. has definitely got a bent outer rim, but whether it affects the tyre uh, or whether he has to change it or not, we'll uh, have to wait and see. But it's definitely got a bent outer rim. He's nerfing his way past Larry Perkins there, or trying to, should we say? Larry's not giving it away too easily. Now, Larry. Larry obviously has dropped a lot of placings with the down on horsepower engine. We think that he's probably lost uh, one or two cylinders now. So here we go again. John Morton going by Larry Perkins, the UVK Commodore. Larry will be looking forward to the new homologation which will appear during the year. Close moment there for both drivers, but. Uh, Larry Perkins will be looking forward to new homologation which will be due in about six months time which will allow the Commodores to gain some weight advantage that is they will have to they will be able to remove their 200 odd kilos of lead which they are carrying today because as Peter said earlier because they are running 5044 cc when they get the smaller engine they will be able to lower their weight and make that Holden more competitive or at least super competitive in the hands of Robert Perkins We'll get our next screen from which we can call off from. Yes. Well, we've had a word with the race promoter, or one of the race promoters, or shall I say, race uh, entrepreneurs, Ian Gamble, and he's just been with the Volvo team, and they can see that John Morton is leading the race. So. Uh, if they, in fact, conceded, I suppose that means that John Morton's on his way to $20,000. Well, it depends on uh, Robbie Fenisovic is uh, closing and uh, there's another 17 laps to go and anything can happen. It's just all part of the excitement that we've generated this weekend. It's a happening. It's one of those things that only happens now and again, and we certainly hope it happens this time next year. But and the interest in this race from all, all of the motoring people, all the crowds in Wellington, enormous stands here. A lot of people come to watch this inaugural race, and yes, there has been a few teething problems, but uh, it hasn't detracted from a one hell of a race. I would like to make sure. Well, we think that he's actually caught back about 10 seconds in that incident, so on our watches, we would say approximately 20 seconds the difference on that at this point. We'll put a watch on that. And here's the replay on that. Yes, John Morton got caught out there. Just got two too tight and well, actually that made contact with the other car which we didn't see which was dave mcmillan and i wouldn't be surprised if he hasn't gone through the uh, into the building and had an accident so uh the two cars appeared to touch that and uh, dave mcmillan would have had a tremendous fight his car was tipped onto its side well this is the sort of excitement we look for in endurance races but we and don't ever get it this is, this is fantastic stuff right at the end or dying stage of the street race we're in the same so same situation we were three quarters of an hour ago whereby Robbie Fenisovic we thought was 20 seconds behind um, 20 seconds behind and here we are again approximately 20 seconds behind with final result John Morton is going to look back at a couple of spins that were unnecessary and say that cost $20,000 yes well it's absolutely you couldn't choreography a race to be like this or any race meeting it, from the pessimism that existed a few months ago to the optimism now, it is fantastic. Robbie Bratovic with the job in front of him. Catching by over a second a lap. And he's got a catch. 15 laps. He's got a catch in over a second a lap for 15 laps. And he can do it. And Robbie, we've seen him, he's all fired up. It explains, Tony, why he was so using so much of the road before. And Robbie's still using a lot of the road. I just hope that neither makes a mistake. Be We're waiting now to get another gap between the two. David Oxton has a watch on them. Robbie's using all the road. 13.6 seconds. So that is, in fact, three seconds or two and a half seconds that Robbie's pulled back in that lap. But it's possible. An enormous amount. John Morton being slowed slightly by the traffic, but really it's within Robbie Brantovic's grasp now on lap 139. Ten laps to go in the race. It's certainly within Robbie Brantovic's grasp. This is fantastic. I mean, what can you say? Nearly four hours of 
motoring and you sit, people are sitting on the edges of their seat in absolute excitement there's people standing in the stands are i mean this is amazing come on street racing that's all i can say robbie francovic still pushing this turbo volvo really pushing it one thing they said yesterday in practice was that you could push it as hard as you like for as long as you like they don't blow up they don't break and I'm sure John Morton will be feeling him breathing down his neck yes. in just a few moments. The pressure on John Morton is going to be horrific. And it's... At this point, it's 3 hours 37 minutes, uh, 23 minutes to go, approximately 12 laps to go in our estimation. The lap times that count, car number 11, Robbie Francovic, 131.9. He's still applying the pressure, and the car 6, 137 so John Morton easing back while still trying to preserve his lead but still pressing on fastest of the BMWs on the circuit at the moment 5.7 seconds the difference John Morton unfortunately has had two spins which would have given him a bit of a fright and uh, that I think would be affecting his lap times and Robbie Fritovic who is cars handling superbly has got his adrenaline up and closing in at an enormous rate they're in the same straight now. John Morton at the end of it. There's Robbie Francovic. John Morton just rounded the turn. Robbie Francovic, one car back. That's the gap now for first place. John Morton desperately hanging on, but he must know in the back of his mind that he cannot circulate fast enough to hold that lead. The worst thing in John Morton's mind, he won't want to make him have another spin. He's already had two. He won't want another one. Volvo got past uh, Alan Wolf, so there's no cars between him on the road now, so it's clear road. There is Robbie Francovic, John Morton just going through underneath. John Morton might like this, being passed by Robbie Franicevic, his ex-teammate, twice within the space of about one hour. It's really a bit demoralising. Well, they both know each other's driving skills very, very well. They both know each other's methods very well, but they're both in totally different cars from the one they're accustomed to being in. There's John Morton in the same picture now. Yes. Robbie Francovic closing right up. Will he do it now? Will he wait till the last lap? Knowing Robbie Francovic, he'll want to do it as quick as possible. Robbie he... Francovic has poked the left front guard into something and his attempts to get up to John Morton. We can see the left front guard is now flapping. The Volvo's looking a little bit like a battered Volvo truck, but it's got the speed to catch the leader. And so close now. Past the start finish line goes John Morton and Robbie Francovic. It's only about a second and a half between them. In the next couple of laps, they've still got five or six in hand. After that, Robbie Francovic is going to be through. There's the challenge. Close enough now to do something about it. John Morton knows, apart from the pit signals he's had for the last five or six laps, he can see him in the rear vision mirror. The rear vision mirror will be filled with a big, fat, red brick. Robbie. Here he comes, having a go at this straight. John Morton can't hold him out. Francovic's pass, that's the lead. Robbie Francovic leads the This Is Sport 500. In the dying moments of the race, 141 laps completed, the Volvo in front. From the back of the grid to the leading the race, uh, for the second time, a wonderful achievement. I mean, I mean uh, this is storybook. Flying here at the last minute and in the lead now, this is unreal. Well, I think John Morton has given away the battle just a little. It must be a hopeless task having been passed by a car that you know is so much faster around the circuit. This Volvo has been the real surprise. This is how he got past. Just pulling out from behind and enough horsepower, enough grunt in a straight line to go straight past. John Morton being passed in the second place. New Zealanders first and second at the moment. With all that excitement, let's not forget Neville Crichton and a break, break passage or something. But here's the Here's number place three on your race, Neville Crichton, the black JPS BMW. So the order at this stage with 142 of the 150 laps completed. John, Robbie Francovic has overtaken John Morton. So Robbie Francovic in the Volvo lead, 142 laps. John Morton in the BMW second, 141 laps. 
Neville Crichton in another BMW in third place. In fourth place is Larry Perkins in the VK Commodore. In fifth place is Paul Adams with... Considering he's in the 1600cc class, fifth overall. So less than eight laps remaining. Well, the Volvos wearing some battle scars. We've got race tape holding the right front guard together and the left front guard is flapping around. We know that it's had gallons of water poured into it, but what a performance by this car. As, as Regis told us, expected it to really perform. It was going to be too late, too rushed, but what an effort. Well, I wonder if Gordon had, I still think Robbie Francovic would have caught him the way he's driving because of the differential in these cars. I, I'm not sure, Tony. Those spins also cost John Morton his confidence because we've seen two on camera. He may have had another couple of others, and uh, they affected his uh, confidence. So I really think that if he hadn't had uh, his confidence knocked out of him, it might have had a different result here. But Very still, we've got another seven laps to go, and a lot of things have happened in this race already. We see the man with the chequered flag. He's at the start finish line in preparation for the for the closure of the race. But uh, we'll watch that flag position. To we're working on a time basis, not a lapse basis. So when the start or the starter and finisher in this case, when the finish finish man decides that the time is up, he drops the flag. So we have to be guided by him. We're waiting for the flag to come out at any moment as Michelle Delcour stands in the pits looking very, very nervous as to whether or not this car is going to hold up. He need have no fear about the driving ability of Robbie Francivic as he's shown us he can go out there and equal Michelle Delcour's excellent lap time. So it's just a little bit of nail biting now. Stay together till the end of the race. Well, the Wellington Nissan Sport 500 race has been sensational from one end to the other, and we're going to have another chance to see this car at Pukakai next weekend, so it'll be interesting to how quick this, BM, this Volvo is going to go without all the troublesome pit stops that it had on early on, which cost a lot of time. So to the uh, people at Auckland who, who want to see the car, then they know where to go next weekend. On the basis of normal scheduled pit stops, this Volvo would have won by something like 11 minutes. Yes, and... Uh, Mark Pitch would be glad that he ended up, uh, that he's the owner of this car, and he can be racing at the New Zealand and future Group A races. So, to the general motor race, we've only seen uh, well, this race has been a credit to the idea born by two men, uh, Ian Gamble and Kerry Powell, two people who've worked with an army of enthusiasts to bring this sport that had to beat negative people who put it down as it will never happen. They've actually made it happen. They've to make sure that the best people they could get would be in this country. They've worked with the city councils and the harbour boards and the scaffolding erectors, the safety people, the crane drivers, thousands of people to bring this race and it must be a vindication to their idea. A tremendous performance by, by two men who brought it to New Zealand. The flag marshal standing down at the start finish line with a flag still but not far away from a finish. They've completed 145 laps. And Robbie Francovic really waltzing away now. We'll get a check on his lap times to see if he's eased off the pace. We would expect him to have eased off the pace. He knew the car was the quickest on the, on the track. And he got to the lead. He doesn't... Here's Jaguars, all the other cars, and, uh, and I'm glad that we've got a different here today and uh, people will be thinking re-evaluating what they do next year and of course the circuit to some extent has suited the Volvo well, by our watches we have 10 minutes to go now obviously but 10 minutes to go would give another five or six laps at least so uh, we'll just keep an eye on the man with the checkered flag and wait for him to near as we can ascertain 10 minutes to go. The interesting thing is everybody's always said that turbo cars were unreliable, but here you have a turbo car being run under Group A regulations, which means you can't run very high boost, and so your turbo is reliable, and not like Formula 1 motor racing that we see on television, or even in Bathurst motor racing, Group C's. So here we have the Group A turbos 
being exceptionally reliable, and I would think that future Group A cars that are turbo, the reliability will also be there. With the chequered flag, so we presume he just doesn't want to be late, but he's, uh, he's awaiting instructions from the official man with the watch. He's got a finger out saying it's one lap to go to Robbie oh, Francovic. And oh. the credit and to John Morton too, he hasn't made any, he's kept the car the going. Four seconds the difference between the two cars, one lap to go. And there in your picture, John Morton. John Morton picking up because Robbie Francovic has had to slow with that bonnet flapping in the front. He's done enough before that happened to stay away far enough. On the last lap now, the man with the chequered flag. That gap's Ready getting close. It. It's closing. $20,000. After four hours of racing, it's come down to this. Robbie on for long enough, though. John Morton closing back up on him. Look at how much Robbie Franzovic has had to slack it off. John Morton has sensed it. He's trying to close that gap. Coming down this time for the chequered flag. Half a lap to go. I wonder if he can stay in front. John Morton has sensed it. I can tell by the way he's closing up. He's seen that there is a chance there. Half a lap left now. Robbie Francovic can just hold him off, I think, around as they approach the bridge. Coming over the bridge for the last time. The chequered flag is ready to be waved. John Morton flying behind him. I know in the last lap or so, he said that Robbie has slowed so much. It's coming down to a sprint down to the top finish line. Robbie Francovic will keep his foot right in it. Coming down to the chequered flag now. Robbie Francovic wins.